garment. That's followed at 7 a.m. Eastern by Washington Journal. Guests include Evan Thomas, managing editor of Newsweek, Ramesh Panuru of National Review, and Tavis Smiley of Black Entertainment Television. Next, a hearing on the contested congressional election in California's 46th district. Former Congressman Bob Dornan is challenging last year's election results, in which freshman Loretta Sanchez defeated him. Yesterday, the House Oversight Committee heard testimony from Congresswoman Sanchez and her lawyers, as well as Mr. Dornan and his legal team. The hearing, which took place in Santa Ana, California, lasts about three and a half hours. The hearing will come to order. We now turn to the next item in the agenda, which is a presentation by contestee Loretta Sanchez. And we have just received her statement and also the presentation of her, her attorney, Wiley Aitken, who will uh, make the comments and will be in, control, in charge of the presentation. Uh, so we Welcome you, Congresswoman Sanchez. We thank you for the hospitality of your district and uh, have certainly enjoyed our time here. So if you'll put up your right hand, I will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force in the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I first want to thank you for convening this hearing and to recognize the thoroughness with which you have fulfilled your responsibility to the Congress. To Mr. Ney and to Mr. Hoyer, I know how much this obligation takes away from your other responsibilities, and so I thank you for being here. As you know, I wrote to you in February with a specific request that the House afford my constituents the opportunity to participate in these deliberations, and I am disappointed that request could not be honored for all of those who wanted to speak here today. In spite of that, I welcome you to Orange County. I would have preferred that you come here under different circumstances. I wish also that you had more time to stay. I would like to introduce you to the place I call home, where my parents raised me and six brothers and sisters. I could show you where I went to elementary school, high school, to college, and more importantly, to introduce you to the people and the places I am now so privileged to represent. I am able to introduce you to my parents, Ignacio and Maria Sanchez. They are here in the audience along with my brothers and sisters. Frank, a Marine for eight and a half years. Martha, who is expecting her for her first baby any moment now. <laughs> Linda and Michael and my brother-in-law, Bruce. I hope the baby will wait until after the conclusion of the hearing. <laughs> it's 10 days late. <laughs> I think it is important for you to know that my parents, like so many who live in this community and across America, came here from Mexico to realize the great American dream. They worked hard. Our family did not have much growing up, but our parents gave us all they had so that we, their children, would have the tools to realize our hopes and our dreams. With their help and guidance and love, every one of us graduated from college. We are lawyers, business people, artists, and yes, there is even a congresswoman. My family is deeply patriotic, and they take their right to vote very seriously. Some of them are Republicans, but I really don't hold that against them. We have family values, and we value families. Most of all, we are proud of this great country in which we live. But you know, there is nothing special or unusual about the Sanchez family of Anaheim. Throughout the 46th district, families have wonderful stories to tell of their own American dreams. They represent many ethnic groups. Yet, these are the very families Mr. Dornan, Dornan has so wrongly accused of being illegal aliens, coming across the border just to kick him out of office. 
There are many families we will introduce to you today. Behind all these numbers tossed around in formal pleadings are real people with real lives. They are Americans, unfairly characterized as being illegal on the basis of some computer printout whose legal votes Mr. Dornan would just throw away. It has been insulting and humiliating for these people to be named in public as conspirators to commit fraud when all they wanted to do was to exercise their right to vote, including some who have fought in wars to guarantee the right to vote for others. I commend your attention the well-known sentiment of former President Reagan, perhaps best expressed in remarks made on the occasion of his signing a proclamation recognizing National Immigrants' Day on July 4, 1986. He said, the immigrants who have so enriched America include people from every race, creed, and ethnic background, yet all have been drawn here by shared values and a deep love of freedom. I would ask the unanimous consent of the task force that the President's entire remarks on that occasion be inserted in the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. As to the merits of this case, or should I say, the six-month ordeal, Mr. Chairman, I stand ready to support any serious, legitimate inquiry into possible voting irregularities. I believe the district attorney is conducting a professional, independent, and thorough investigation. There is no need, no justification, nor any constitutional mandate for Congress to duplicate or interfere with those efforts. But Congress does have a responsibility to ensure the integrity of its own elections to promote voter confidence in the electoral process, and to ensure every citizen has fair, open, and equal access to the ballot box. I would hope that you would devote as much energy and resources to pursuing those important issues. The United States enjoys the dubious distinction of having the lowest voter participation of every democracy in the world. I would encourage you to explore ideas being tested in states to ease access to the polls, including vote by mail, electronic voting, and extending polling hours. Here today, you will see that Bob Dornan's case falls apart when the true facts are laid upon the table. His case is composed primarily of distortions, falsehoods, rumor, and innuendo. In the few instances where Mr. Dornan has made specific allegations naming actual voters, his documents are chock full of mistakes. Mr. Chairman, you very accurately laid out the mission of this task force at your February hearing in Washington, D.C. First, to determine if any questionable ballots were cast, and if so, to assess if there is any credible evidence that would change the outcome of the election. That should be the laser-like focus of this task force. Regrettably, Mr. Dornan has made your job incredibly difficult. His allegations are a constantly moving, ever-changing target for your laser to focus upon. In the beginning, he offered bizarre theories of phantom ballot boxes, ghost voting, and Nicaraguan drug lords intervening in this election. Then, Mr. Dornan moved on to new charges filed with the registrar and others about misconduct at the polling places, which he later abandoned altogether. Desperate, he filed a three-page notice of contest with the House with vague generalizations, many of which he never again repeated. After I filed a detailed motion for dismissal, he filed a rehash of allegations previously discredited by the registrar's investigation and dressed them up in a conspiracy theory about Latino voters. Allegations about double voting, improper absentee ballots, illegal registrations at businesses, and so-called suspicious households have proved to be patently false, not only by our field investigation, which, which interviewed over 300 voters he wrongly accused, but by independent investigations conducted by the Registrar of Voters and by various news agencies. Today, we will demonstrate that the only remaining allegation with any substantiation is just as flawed. 
of the 574 voters in the last election in this district who were registered by Hermandad, the overwhelming majority were legal, proper votes of U.S. citizens. To go beyond today's hearing, you are asked to embrace Mr. Dornan's newest conspiracy theory because the claims he has made to date do not come close to changing the outcome of the election. He now wants a fishing license to search for evidence that fraud must have committed by a whole range of groups similar to Ermon Dodd. Mr. Chairman, not only is this a slender thread on which to justify a massive expenditure of taxpayers' funds, it leads into the very dangerous territory of intimidation of legitimate political participation by innocent third parties. Let me give you an example of where the new Dornan conspiracy theory leads. In the last few days, Mr. Dornan's subpoena effort has requested of the county the registration affidavits of groups such as the Associated Students of Orange Coast College, the Santa Ana Firefighters, Teachers United, Americans for Democracy, the League of Women Voters, the Asian Pacific Student Association, Santa Ana Public Library, Pro-Choice of Orange County, the Vietnamese Community of Orange County, and the Diocese of Orange of the Roman Catholic Church, and more than 100 other groups and individuals. For this committee, or the House of Representatives, to sanction such a broad-based investigation in search of evidence of a massive paranoid conspiracy theory is not only beneath the dignity of this House, it is an unconstitutional invasion into the guaranteed right of every American to participate in the political process. Mr. Dornan has also dredged up new allegations against the public servants in the registrar's office. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I made a specific request that Ms. Lever be given time aside from other witnesses so that she could speak at length about her investigation and respond to the unfair charges of misconduct made against her. I consider this not only a matter of fairness, but essential to your task of getting all the evidence. Since my request was not honored, I have asked my counsel to set aside time from our presentation for Ms. Lever to respond to these newest charges. Finally, I wish to caution you against any stereotypes or generalizations. There were two, two Hispanic candidates on the ballot in this congressional race. The overwhelming majority of the votes cast for me came from Anglo voters. It is an insult to suggest that Latino voters are of one mind or that there were not Hispanic voters who supported the Republican Party or candidate Dornan. I commend to your attention a poll in yesterday's Los Angeles Times. Almost a quarter of Latino voters interviewed in the poll volunteered that they would support Mr. Dornan in a new election, even despite his careless and intemperate remarks. After today, I am confident the task force will be able to assure the House that no one has made any respectable claim supported by any credible evidence that would remotely come close to changing the outcome of this election. My attorney, Mr. Wiley Aiken, and his colleague, Mr. Fred Wusher, are here to lay out the true facts in this case. With that, I now turn the presentation over to Mr. Aiken. After his presentation, we will be ready to take any questions. Let me uh, just thank you for your comments. Congresswoman Sanchez, and uh, to make two quick comments. Number one, it's, it was a pleasure to hear someone pronounce Ermandad correctly. I think you're the first witness to do that. And <laughs> secondly, uh, uh, your comment that you wrote in February of a specific request that the House afford uh, your constituency opportunity to participate in these deliber deliberations. I'm sorry you were not here to hear my comments on that this morning, and Mr. Hoyer's. Uh, but uh, as you probably know by now, the Congress never entertains public comment at its hearings. And I have always wanted to, perhaps because of my state and local government background. 
Uh, but it's a difficulty working it in with so many requests. But we reached a compromise. Uh, Mr. Hoyer and, and Mr. Ney and I discussed this last night. Yes, I'm and Mr. <coughs> Hoyer had some concerns about it. So we will have some public comment, but we're restricting it to the heads or spokespersons of the organizations who are interested in this. Well, I was out this morning, as you know, performing my congressional duties with the senior citizens group, the Vietnamese, also uh, with a small business development center. So I was not here. <laughs> earlier for the hearing. Oh, I thought members of Congress had the weekends free. <laughs> you and I both. <laughs> yeah, we know otherwise. Okay, Mr. Aitken, sorry for the brief interlude. Uh, well, that's all right. I assume it won't be taken out of my time. Yeah, well, I'll give you an extra minute if you should run short. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to be sworn. That, that is correct. Uh, we, I want to keep up with everybody out there. Yes, right. Would you uh, please... Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Absolutely. Thank you. You may proceed. First of all, let me comment that uh, if I had known that I was going to be complimented by Mr. Hart about how I've worked with him, I would have changed the way I worked with him before I got here today. Uh, my name is Wiley Aiken. I am a trial lawyer. And by the way, I want to make it very clear that I am not in any way apologetic about being an attorney or a lawyer. Uh, I'm very proud of my profession. And I happen to be a lawyer who also grew up in the 46th district, having attended high school here at Garden Grove, as well as going to Rancho Santiago College, a college you certainly have heard about. One of my classmates at Santa Ana College, as well as Garden Grove High School, was a fellow young man named Bill Thomas, who we knew would never add up to anything, and he certainly proved that to be true. I am a past president of the state's <laughs> trial bar. The three bar. of us are going to hold you in contempt if you mean by that he was elected to the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I am a past president of the state's trial bar, and I was chair of the Loretta Sanchez campaign and personally was involved in some of the uh, comments that have been made during the course of today. And I now appear in front of you as her chief lawyer in what has been, I believe, kindly described as Dornan's election contest otherwise known throughout most of Orange County as Dornan's Folly. And I want to tell you that I have heard some statements made here in the last 45 minutes that I am very deeply disturbed by. And I'm, the fact that I may not comment on them in my initial presentation is to no way suggest that I concur with some of the representations that have been made to this committee in the last presentation and anyway concur with some of the inaccuracies that have been put out. It is an honor for me to make this presentation on behalf of Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez, but it's also an honor to make this presentation on behalf of the Orange County community. However, I cannot help but feel that my being here is unfortunate for all of us because this community and the political system that operates within this community is an excellent system. We're proud of our new citizens as well as those people who were born here. We're all taxpayers and longtime residents and groups of all races, colors, and creeds. And what's really come out of this contest is an attempt to somehow cast doubt on this community. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, coming here this morning, I heard on the phone, or not on the phone, but on the radio, that you've already pronounced before the evidence here today that there'll be more hearings. And unfortunately, I think that is a mistake, as I will point out to you as we go through the process. And I think it's unfortunate because it will lead nothing but the greater expense and unfortunately greater division within our community. Coming here today, I heard that, of course, that today really is the NFL draft day. And I couldn't help but think, having worked with this case so closely over the last six months, that somehow Bob Dornan perceives himself as a high draft pick, but like so many who do not have the talent or the credentials, like being elected by the voters, he will be sitting at home and his phone will never ring. But at least the NFL has the good sense to get the pain over with in only a couple of days. Observing Washington from the real world where we all live and work and hopefully sometimes play, we see that we've become a society obsessed with investigations rather than governing and helping people. We see a conspiracy behind every bush. A society where a simple hello is to be viewed with suspicion and to be analyzed. A Congress sometimes more interested in accusations and what tears us apart as opposed to what brings us together. The 46th district is not a Republican district 
or a Democratic district or an Hispanic district, but a district of hardworking people with the same hopes, aspirations, fears, and optimisms that make this county so great and this state so great. I have to apologize to some degree because as a trial lawyer, I am used to operating in a real courtroom with real rules of evidence. As a trial lawyer, no one could come into a quasi-judicial proceeding and make the kinds of accusations and statements that have been made in this area and in this room without real, real evidence to back it up. So it's been a very eye-opening experience for me and for our community to see what occurs when one can make accusations, allegations, reckless charges, vicious rumors, thinly veiled and not so thinly veiled character assassination, and somehow parade that around as being evidence. It certainly has been suggested that in light of some of the allegations we have heard in this particular race, that these allegations make a lot more sense being presented three miles down the road in Disneyland in the middle of Fantasyland than here in the Hall of Administration of Justice. If, in fact, the standard is that credible evidence should be presented, not allegations, not innuendo, not guilt by association in the worst of American traditions, and, in fact, whether that credible evidence resulted in a change or could and should and would have resulted in a change in the results of the 46th election, then if that's the standard, as I understand it to be, then this entire case falls apart. I've had the misfortune to read those two books that you've been given about the so-called alleged evidence put forth by Mr. Dornan and his legal team. And I can only describe the presentation as un-American as ever I have seen a presentation being made to a congressional committee. When, I, when is it in our society, or when should it ever be acceptable to describe native-born or naturalized citizens who exercise their right to vote in the way they have been described in the papers filed with this committee? And as this pol committee has said so politely, that this is not about immigration, and this is not about race, then perhaps this committee will explain to us why they have accepted documents from Mr. Dornan that list and make statements that there have been undocumented illegal aliens who have voted in this election when there is absolutely no proof of that fact. And not only is there no proof of it, when we went out and investigated, we found that these were very legitimate citizens, some who fought for this country who are in a class of citizen that they've identified as being undocumented illegal aliens. At some point in time, the committee will learn what our community is learning, and that is enough is enough. In the papers filed with you and put forth before this committee, they have proposed and put in a declaration by a gentleman who says, in effect, that 10% of all the new Hispanic citizens are felons. And if you want to have a new election, all you have to do is count up how many new citizens who are Hispanics who voted and take 10% from that number, and they're all going to be presumed to be felons. And that alone, by a declaration filed with these papers, is a justification to set aside the will of the people of the 46th Congressional District. Within those papers you have received, they have promoted rating mailboxes, going through trash cans, peeking through windows, standing at doors, interviewing neighbors, and every other kind of offensible, offensive conduct that you could possibly describe. We've already heard about the various theories of Nicaraguan drug lords. They have publicly defamed naturalized citizens by publicly stating that hundreds of them perjured themselves by not revealing prior criminal records, which is totally false. They have falsely claimed in papers that open ballot box, boxes suddenly appear at the registrar's office. They falsely accuse twins and fathers and fathers and sons with double voting. They've attacked large families. And isn't it interesting that every time they make an allegation, 
And every time they make a charge, and every time we, the accused, go out and do their work for them and disprove it, they say, oh, well, that's off the table now. This is the constant moving, dorning target. If you disprove one allegation, make another one. And that's, in fact, why suddenly we hear before this committee that certain matters are being taken off the table. And they're not being taken off the table because of any intent to be fair or honest or deal with this election. They're being taken off the table because we took the time and the effort to disprove these allegations. So when they attack large families, what was the definition of their suspicious households? Any f residents where six or more voted. Now, as an Irish Catholic, the only thing I share in common with Mr. Dornan, I would have to apologize to suggest that large families somehow are a suspicious household. And I might comment that I also was born in Michigan, but I was born in the heart of Detroit, not in one of the suburbs, to a relatively poor Irish Catholic family, so I, of course, was raised as a Democrat. And in that case, we have a situation where now have they not only raised questions about large families, but they're talking about nursing homes, retirement communities, all of which they say are illegal business addresses where people were voting. And when we went out and did the work for them, what, in fact, did we have but retirement communities, nursing homes, even a place where nuns were living uh, under the category of suspicious households. And in just in the last few minutes, there's no other way to slice it, gentlemen. In the last few minutes, they basically have accused our registrar, Ros Lieber, of not being honest and not being candid. There's another word for that, and we know exactly what they've publicly accused Ros Lieber of. And I said at the time, with a letter to this committee, that she should go after Mr. Dornan's presentation, because how rare is it that the accused has to go before the accuser? And they've done more in holding up than ridicule citizens who were ill. One of the so-called people who returned their ballot inappropriately was someone who was ill and had to rely upon the emergency pr provisions of turning their ballot in. So they relied upon an in-law, the, their nearest relative, to deliver their ballot. And those are individuals they want to strike their vote because somehow it wasn't a definition of one of the people allowed to turn in the ballot by way of being a blood relative. And we have individuals here today who are going to represent, so you can see a name and a face to the charges that are being so loosely thrown around this community. What we have heard would almost be laughable if it were not so tragic. Because it just adds another sad chapter to the disillusionment that spreads throughout our society and then we ask ourselves, well, why do people not vote? Why do people have an, an interesting attitude about how they look at their elected officials? Why are they disillusioned about how government works? And one of the things that has to cause great disillusionment in this community is to any kind of credence given to the conduct we have seen after November 5th of 1996. But in understanding what a controversy is all about, you first have to understand what it's not about. This is not about Loretta Sanchez's lack of commitment to see that election laws are enforced and that only one person be given one vote. And if, in fact, they can prove through a real investigator, a district attorney, that somebody violated the law, then that person should be prosecuted. But that is not what Mr. Dornan is really interested in. It's not about some national conspiracy by groups who suggest that we're all out there trying to do a terrible, awful thing. Catholic Charities and all of these groups are doing an awful, terrible thing, aren't they? They're out trying to get people registered and asking them to participate in the democratic process. They're out there helping them become citizens. And for that, let's add them to the list of groups to be investigated out of Washington. This is not about illegal and undocumented aliens. We are talking about legal residents taking citizenship classes who, if you look at that list of 303 people, the great number of which, whose alleged offense was that, if anything, they were too anxious to participate in democracy and registered before they completed their citizenship but voted after, in fact, they were citizens. 
This is not about Herman Dodd. Whatever Herman Dodd did or did not do is something that has to be left with the district attorney. And you've already heard a misrepresentation made to you about the fact that, well, 1160, but there's more out there to find. The fact of the matter is they went through every single registration number that was checked out to Herman Dodd. These are not just the people who registered. They checked every single registration that was checked out to Herman Dodd and only found that 1160 people actually, in fact, became registered. Yet they would suggest there are numbers out there that haven't been checked when, in fact, they were checked. And this is not about some connection between Loretta Sanchez, Congresswoman Sanchez, and Herman Dodd and any other independent expenditure committee. To suggest otherwise is to repeat a clear falsehood. And to repeat it is not worthy of any single member of Congress or any single member of this committee. As the chair of her campaign, I can assure this committee there was absolutely no connection between Herman Dodd and any other independent expenditure committee. And we learned, like everyone else did, about a check being written from Dump Dornan, nonetheless a worthy cause, to Herman Dodd or to Nativo Lopez and his kids and parents. And we went, how did we learn about it? Not because of some brilliant investigation by Dornan and his so-called legal team, but in the mere fact these were public documents filed in a public place. And that, in fact, is the absolute truth. And so to, and we know, anybody who understands the law and understands the independent expenditure, expenditure committees, there is no way that you are to communicate with those committees. There's no way you have the knowledge. That would be the violation. The, the writing the check is not the violation. The violation would be if we played any role in the writing of that check or in any way directed it. And I can assure you, they cannot make such an al allegation and to do so is an absolute, complete, and total falsehood and I hope that position is clear to this committee. So what, in fact, is this all about? It's allegedly also not about one other fact. This is not about massive voter fraud. Why did we ever allow ourselves to get into the trap to suggest that 303 people, best case scenario, is somehow the most massive voter fraud in the history of the world. I guess Orange County has taken over for another place I used to live when I was a young boy. That was Chicago in Cook County. Now I find out that we are the greatest example of the most massive fraud in any course of an election based on 303 people, which is 0.00003% of the voters in this district. So now we're back to Disneyland, and we're back into fantasy. And it's about someone who thinks he's discovered an heir, to put this in perspective for you, by a bank clerk, which has nothing to do with the financial health of the bank, but who's, because he discovered this one small little heir in the bank, wants to declare himself chairman of the board. Well, Mr. Dornan, you're not going to be called. There is a new chairman of the board. Her name is Loretta Sanchez. And yes, a woman who also happens to be an Hispanic, and it's not the citizens of Orange County's fault that you are incapable of genetically, graciously accepting the fact that you were defeated by a woman. Now let's look at the evidence, the so-called credible evidence, not the allegations and not the rumors. And let me explain to you that the evidence I'm about to show you was gathered by us and not by Mr. Dornan. Mr. Dornan does not investigate. Mr. Dornan makes allegations and makes charges. We have to then go out and check all of these charges. We've already heard how much money we have spent in Orange County through the office of the registrar to check out every time he has a new allegation and how much money they've spent. And we've had to go out and investigate the so-called charges. And I have a number of charts here, and I'll take you through them. So hopefully, once and for all, we can put this matter in perspective because you can appreciate how difficult it is to prove a negative and how sad it needs that we, the accuser, have to do and check the evidence. So if I could see those charts and I, if we could put them up there. First of all, 
What I have here is fantasy number one by Mr. Dornan, that there is massive voter fraud in Orange County. When I went to a statistical person to say I wanted to illustrate how many people that we know of illegally voted in this particular election, he said you cannot even statistically show it. We're talking about a county of 1.2,775,000 voters. Total registrations countywide from Hermadot 1160, of which 759 voted, of which possibly, and that's going to fall apart, gentlemen, possibly 442 countywide were improper ballots. That does not even show up on a chart. And from that fact, the only fact, we are being described as the massive voter fraud in Orange County. Now, let me show you another chart that we have prepared for you. And this is what I call Dornan fantasy number two. He says there's this massive conspiracy between the Republican registrar, an outstanding public servant, and somehow illegal aliens who have somehow stole the election from him. Now, what you see here on this chart is a breakdown of the voters in the 46th Congressional District. 173,000 potential voters. The total Herman Dodd votes, 564. The potential unlawful ballots, 303. That is the so-called basis of a conspiracy to somehow deny Mr. Dornan office. And let's put things in context for those of you who are not here, and did not live through the election in the fall of 1996. I hope you appreciate and understand when someone start, starts talking about stealing an election, that you're aware of the fact that the poll done by the register, now not the, not the phony uh, phone poll that Mr. Hart referred to. Did you understand what that phony poll was that he paraded in front of you? That's one of those phone things where they ask you each day, you can phone in, and if you pay a dollar, you can vote as to whether you think there should be a hearing in Orange County or not, and then you hire somebody in your office to put an automatic dialer in and pay for a dollar for every call. That was not a poll. The real poll, which was done by the register the weekend before the election, showed Loretta Sanchez ahead in that race by two percentage points. So that was the poll upon which one would expect that the real poll of the election day would show Loretta Sanchez the victor, and that's in fact what happened. And that, of course, has been followed by another poll of just a few days ago that has shown us that that lead has increased to 13%. So when you look at this uh, chart here, you can see that none of this would any way raise itself to the level that one would suggest there's any kind of massive illegal activity. And the only way you can raise it to that kind of level is to go out and throw a bunch of accusations against Rancho San Diego College, against Catholic Charities, against the labor unions, and everyone else you can find in order to somehow justify continuing to waste public funds. And remember that we're supposed to be talking about fraud, not about whether or not somebody, mistakenly or otherwise, may have voted in this election. Now let me show you what we have as another chart. What we say is Dornan fantasy number three. That fantasy says we should spend more taxpayer dollars and we should continue this investigation based on what I have provided to you. Now, it's always hard for me to respond to Mr. Dornan's charges. And the reason is they've changed every day, every minute, and every hour. At one point, the universe was something like 3,000 votes, and that's what we show you here. And he included in there potential unlawful votes, double voting, suspicious households, Hermadod, uh, Herman Dodd registrations, business addresses, absentee voters, vendor tapes, and a moving target. We have done our own investigation. They've taken al almost everything off the table except the 303, and we've investigated the 303, and that is down to 77. So never, ever 
let yourself get caught in a trap and make the mistake that there has been proven that 303 people voted illegally in the 46th Congressional District because the list that they're using, the list that Secretary Jones is losing, using, and the list that the INS is using is not a list that is accurate. And in fact, they're relying upon such things as we have no record of these people. We have 69 people who, whom we have no record who happen to be foreign born. Did ever, does anyone ever realize that if you're foreign born in a country of, with a United States citizen, of a United States citizen, you're automatically a citizen even though you're foreign born? Did anyone ever realize that people who were naturalized before 1960 will not show up in the INS records? Do we realize that when we went out and talked to these individuals we could reach who were 69 on this list of 69 people who were foreign born, that the error rate was over 50 percent and they were showing us evidence of their citizenship, some who even served their country. So don't ever fall into the trap of the fact that there has been proven 303 voters who voted unlawfully uh, based on the so-called Jones test. I, as a trial lawyer, are always used, they use the accusation that somehow lawyers go around filing what they call frivolous lawsuits. Apparently a former member of Congress can form any kind, file any kind of frivolous lawsuit he wants and not in fact be held accountable for that. Now let me show you what we have here in terms of the analysis. We went out and talked to a number of individuals, many of whom are here today, and we went through the list. And remember, the list from the INS had things as not naturalized pending. They had a pending status review. They had a no record. And then they had another category called no notation within the citizenship department. So we went ahead and took those votes and went out and talked to people, for instance, who in fact were listed as no record, who in fact were 65 of them were US born. And another part of that group, the remaining part of the 65, were foreign born and found out of the individuals we talked about it was running 81 percent. We only were able to contact seven of that number and six of them had proof of citizenship. So we had an error rate of something like 86 percent of those individuals we had to talk to who in fact were being listed in the 303 number. So when you do the actual people we've been able to identify, the people we went out and talked to, determine the appropriate error rate, and error rate that we discovered ourselves just from the INS records that were used to do this 303 projection. The error rate indicates that the actual number of potential illegal voters are in the area of 70 votes and not 303. And that's what we discovered in terms of both doing the investigation and the analysis of the study by Mr. Dornan, as well as the study done, in fact, by uh, Mr. Jones. Now, we do have some individuals with us here today, and I think you should appreciate and understand their background. In the area of absentee ballots, we have, I think, Mr. Angel Lara is here, and I'd ask him to stand up. Mr. Lara's absentee ballot was challenged on the basis that the signature did not match. Mr. Lara has voted for a quarter of a century without anyone ever challenging his vote before. He met the investigator at his door with his naturalization certificate showing he was a naturalized citizen in 1971. His signature did not match because it had changed somewhat since when he first registered in 1971. Mr. Lara showed us letters from the city of Santa Ana commending him for his excellent work as a Parks Department employee from which he retired after 20 years of service. Mr. Lara is one of the citizens of Orange County who has a right to an apology from Mr. Dornan. We have with us Maria Jimenez, I believe is her name. She was listed in the Hermandad list as a pending status review. She was born in the United States, not reflected in the records of the INS. She showed us her birth certificate and her social security card. And she was born on June 24th, 1974, in Orange, California. Yet this committee has thrown around and accepted the use of the word 303. And here is an individual. Would you, maybe you'd like to see a name and a face for one of these 303 individuals accused by Mr. Dornan. 
We have here in the area of suspicious households, Sister Jennifer Ogorek. Now, Sister Jennifer is the administrator of the St. Catharines Military Academy. She was accused in Mr. Dorning's pleading to this Congress of voting illegally because six or more voted from the address in which she lives. In fact, 18 Dominican nuns reside at this particular residence and, fr and from that address. They've owned the school and they have lived, that school has been owned by the Dominican sisters since 1888. Sister Jennifer has told us she's concerned that the allegations in Congress that the school was engaged in some kind of illegal election activity is going to affect their fundraising. She's accompanied this morning by Chris Reagan, who is the development director of the school, and Lori Gutierrez, who is the secretary to the school administrator. We also have Cecilia Urado here. She is another individual who was accused of double voting by Mr. Dornan. Their names did appear twice in the precinct roster. And since there are 6,400 volunteer poll workers in Orange County who do, who, their, who do that job once every two years, most of them never see a situation like this. So when her, uh, when her friend showed up, they asked them to sign at two different lines, and they thought they were being protective that way because they showed up being double. The name got printed twice on the sheet. In both the cases, the poll workers gave only one ballot to Angie and her friend Cecilia and innocently asked them to sign the roster twice, twice, one after each entry, though their name was printed on two occasions. They did this in order to see that no one else used their name and ballot and voted under their name. They did it to, in effect, cross it out so that, in fact, there would not be a double ballot. And in the area, there are other people here who's, uh, by name, we have a Maria Cortez, we have Sonia Tunez, all the people who are on the Hermandad list who in fact are citizens and were citizens before they registered and were in fact citizens before they vote. Now I'd like to show you another chart and I want to skip to the reality, what I call reality number one. So I did have another chart showing the shrinking Jones universe, but I think you've gotten the message that we went out and investigated and that 303 figure goes down to 77. Yes, gentlemen, there has been attempted massive voter fraud in Orange County. The problem is the attempted massive voter fraud did not occur during the election. It did not occur on the day of the election. It began the day after the election, when Mr. Dornan began to make these unfounded charges that somehow somebody took the election away from him. That is the true story of voter fraud in Orange County, and that's the message that should go out of this hearing as to where the voter fraud occurred, because they have taken 303 people, down probably now to 77, and tried to use that as a mechanism by which to defeat the will of the voters of the 46th Congressional District. I have sat here in this room and listen to speeches about how somebody got trumped and if 100 people voted the wrong way or voted when they shouldn't have, they X'd out the vote of 100 other people. That is wrong and that should be prosecuted. But has anyone ever seen the attempt to use 303 votes to cancel the ballot of 47,000 964 people? Do we really understand that they're trying to use 303 people to, in effect, take the way the vote of over 47,000 citizens in Orange County, all of whom vote and live in the 46th Congressional District? So yes, yes, we have massive voter fraud. And unfortunately, it's allowed to continue and go on in front of our very eyes. The gentleman's time has expired. So. Thank you. Thank you for your Was that the extra minute I also got? Uh, the, the extra minute was during the yellow period. Okay. <laughs> which may have whizzed by you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate uh, your comments. And several questions. Uh, first, let me just uh, 
I have a few questions and comments for Ms. Sanchez, if, if you would go to the stand a moment, please. In your written testimony, uh, you have the comment that that we, you hope we would devote as much energy and resources to pursuing other important issues than the ones that we're dealing with here. Encourage us to explore ideas being tested in states to ease access to the polls, including vote by mail, electronic voting, and extending polling hours. Uh, first of all, just a comment, that's not the responsibility of this task force, but I do want to say that I certainly agree with you. We should make it as easy as possible for individuals to vote. Uh, the issue here is not how we're dealing with voting, but with registration. And the important part is to make certain that both the registration and the, elec the election process is valid. And, but I'd be happy to join you in, in any efforts to make uh, voting easier okay. and uh, more representative. Also, uh, you refer to this in your testimony as uh, a massive expenditure of taxpayer funds as this investigation proceeds. Uh, that is not really a fair characterization. We are expending some taxpayer funds, but first of all, I want you to know, being Dutch, I managed to get out here on a $252 airline ticket, which well, I think is a pretty good deal. Well, I usually come out here on a $181 oh, good, round ticket, so you better take some pointers from me, Chairman. Good. I will have to talk to you about that. But in any event, our, our, uh, the massive expenditure is... Uh, well, when you it's, add is a little unfair characterization. When you but add all of the staff work, when you add all the time we're spending in committee, you're spending in committee. When you add all of the time that it takes away from my, uh, you know, from my congressional office, when we are putting forth all of this information, it grows and grows every day. When you have Bill Jones doing it at the state level, you have the de the district attorney doing it here, and I think he's doing an adequate job here. You know, I really think you need. I really believe what you said in your February hearing is correct that it's got to be laser-like, and you've got to really concentrate on this election, not all of these allegations that Mr. Dornan is allowed to banty around. Well, we're not allowing anyone to dance around any allegations, uh, in, including yours. Uh, but I just wanted to clarify, there's not a lot of taxpayer funds uh, being expended here. I will uh, say that there's a lot of funds being expended by uh, Mr. Dornan and by you, however, and I'm sure you're personally very aware of that. I, I do also want to uh, question whether uh, one other point, not in relationship to what you said, but in relationship to what you've been uh, purported to say. As I mentioned earlier, and I don't believe you were here when I said that, I've been trying to avoid reading any newspaper accounts of this, but apparently someone gives me a clipping relating to it that they think is of interest. And uh, this, is, this is a quote attributed to you by the Orange County Register approximately a month ago, on March 24th, 97 in which uh, you repeatedly said, we usually think of one half of 1% as a pretty low figure for making mistakes. You're referring to elections. No, and I'm you, referring and you to everyday situations. Just I'm a confused. moment, let me finish. Okay. Uh, we wouldn't have reformed welfare if we only had one half of 1% of fraud in the system. Well, I don't know, I suspect we might have anyway, but uh, the point I, I wanted to get at, uh, do, you, you, do you believe that one half of 1% is an acceptable error rate or an acceptable level of fraud in, in elections? Or, I would or, or leave were you that, misquoted? I would leave that to uh, someone who is an expert in that area, like uh, Ms. Lever, to talk to you about error rates and what might be acceptable. Um, I just happen to say that in particular, in, in everyday life as we go about, uh, we all make mistakes. We, there are you know changes in our lives every day, et cetera and nobody is 100% perfect. No process is 100% perfect. We go and we, we, we try to solve problems where we see that the problems are, are larger than usual, but point, you know, half of 1%, if only, ha if only half of 1% of all lawyers were bad, we wouldn't be saying the things we say about them. There you go after the <laughs> lawyers again. Well, I, I, I think this is an important point. Uh, I think a half percent is, is a very large <laughs> point. And, and in fact, we did ask Ms. Lever about that this morning. Good. Well, uh, then I'm sure she, she gave you uh, the correct answer. And she was, uh, the, the level of error we established in her testimony, of, at least with one area, was about, uh, 
Considerably less than half of that, I think it was right. point, point 0.01, one hundredth of a percent. Then and I stand and corrected. She, the error rate is even lower than I believed. No, hang on. <laughs> Uh, and she said that she thought that was an acceptable error rate, and that's that's probably reasonable. That's much lower than half percent, about a hundredth as much. But the, but she established, as did Mr. Jones in his testimony, that the fraud rate should be zero. There should be zero tolerance for fraud, and that's what I'm trying to get at. It sounds like you're saying half percent. No, is I'm reasonable. saying defer to Miss Lever. Pardon? I, I'm saying I defer to Miss Lever. She's the expert on elections. No, I'm, I'm just simply asking you because of the quote. I, I just want to mention, in this last election, there were uh, three, three elections in the, to the Congress which were decided by less than half a percent. In the previous uh, election for Congress, there were six which were decided by less than half a percent. And I, I just, uh, I was hoping to give you a chance to, no. to either retract or clarify or say Mr. Chairman, I'm not in favor of fraud. What I talked about was error rate in general. Well, that's what I was trying to clarify because you, your first half of the statement was mistakes. Uh, you well, didn't mistakes say are not fraud. Mistakes but the second be... half of your statement referred to fraud, and I was trying to well, establish. Well, that was welfare related. That was not. Okay, I, as I say, I was trying to give you a chance to clear mm -hmm. uh, clear this up for us because you related the two, and uh, I thought that was an important point to bring out. Uh, thank you. I have no further questions for you, Mr. Aitken. I uh, I have several. Pleasure, sir. Uh, Mr. Aitken, the, um, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you were an attorney and proud of it. And yes, that's true. I think, I that's, think that's admirable because I think being an attorney is a very honorable profession. And uh, Apparently more so than my client does, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's, I, I, noticed <laughs> I noticed that. I think you may have a little repair work to do. <laughs> but the... Uh, I, I believe being an attorney is indeed an honorable profession, and unfortunately, you're the subject to a, a lot of jokes, just as we and members of Congress are. I happen to be a nuclear physicist by profession, and I'm also proud of that. And it was clear to me from, from reviewing your written testimony and your charts and uh, in your comments that um, although you may be an excellent attorney, uh, you're not a very good statistician or a scientist. For example, you quote on your charts that the, uh, the number of votes in question, the 303, is 0.0003%. And you said that in your verbal testimony, testimony as well. First of all, there, you're off by a factor of 100 because the ratio is 0 0.0003, but the percentage is 0.03, three hundredths of a percent. Thank you. Uh, furthermore, that is a percentage of the total registered voters in the county, and as you know, only 10 percent of them voted in the congressional election, which is about 106,000 voters, less than 10 percent. So actually, and, and you know as well as I do, elections are decided by those who vote, not by those who stay home. Well, so uh, it's actually... That, that's very true. That's a sad story, but that's true. That's true. So it's actually 0.3 percent. I, I stand corrected. I would never argue with a nuclear physicist. <laughs> Good. I wish the rest of the world felt that way. Uh, particularly in certain areas. areas. Mr. Chairman, what you're saying is it is 0.3 of 1. What? It's 0.3 percent. When you rear... There's no, 0.03 no, percent. No, it's it's 0.3 percent of the number of people who voted. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. I, I, I don't think so. I don't think 303 is 3 percent of 100,000. No, I said 0.3 percent of 100,000. You can check my numbers later. Okay, okay so the, it's, uh, it's, le it's one third of one percent. Is that what we're talking about? That's how a trial yeah. lawyer would appreciate it. All right, fine. One third of one percent is what we're talking about. All right, fine. That's the massive, best case scenario fraud we've been discussing about. Up to one point. third of one percent. Right. Thank you. Which is I, what I, point I, I three of one is. Right. <laughs> uh, whatever language is convenient for you to express it, but that is an accurate statement as well. Thank you. Um, certainly better than the ones on the chart in your in your submitted testimony. I just wanted to comment that the other charts, too, uh, various, various fantasies and realities you portrayed. Um, whoever does the charts for you does uh, an excellent job of uh, misportraying both fantasy and reality. And I just, I don't have time to go into it, and I don't want to register that. I just want to comment that it was a good presentation, but from a statistician's point of view, uh, there's not much reliability in, in the presentation there. I will take note of that, and I will make sure that there are no more nuclear scientists on my juries. Thank you. 
<laughs> I might suggest to you that's not the first time someone's made that comment. <laughs> the, uh, another point I wanted to bring out, you, in your, in your uh, testimony, your written testimony here, you, you mentioned Irmandad is an independent expenditure committee. No, I didn't say that. I said that there was a check that was given. Uh, there was this, this, there's this bizarre conspiracy theory that somehow suggests that because an independent expenditure committee named Dump Dornan a, wrote a check to another committee called Nativo Lopez, I think, for kids and parents. Right. And then, of course, that happens to be Nativo Lopez for school board. Then, of course, what Mr. Dornan's people say is we've discovered a connection between Congresswoman Sanchez and Herman Dot. And that is the, uh, you correct me on that again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ermandad. Ermandad, yeah. Was, and so in other words, you, you, when you say here that uh, Ermandad is an independent expenditure committee, you're not stating the fact, you're stating, you're making a cynical or sarcastic statement. Is that correct? I'm saying I don't know whether they're an independent expenditure committee or not. I'm using it in the generic term that they have tried to very, I think, in a very nefarious way, try to create a connection between Congresswoman You're Sanchez the Dorn, people. Okay. that does we'll, not, we'll, absolutely does not exist. I understand. Chairman, You're trying to... Mr. Mr. Chairman, what you're looking at, if you put an, where that says an, if you put a D and make it an, it will solve your problem. Um, Actually, I'm, you need to add, add and. Right, the word and what it means is Herman Dodd and and an independent expenditure I, committee. Oh, there was, there, not I, Herman I, there Dodd, I did it comma, again. And an independent expenditure. It's one of those mistakes in life I was talking about. Okay, one, one last quick one. Beef. <laughs> this is a difficult client to control. I want you to understand that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, perhaps at $200 an hour, she expects fewer mistakes. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, just one, one last point, I, a clarification, not a I wasn't aware I was charging that little, but go ahead. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, you mentioned on the radio, you heard me announce that there will be further hearings. I want to simply explain that and to everyone because that question has been asked. Uh, we, we do not know for certain there will be further hearings. Be the process, uh, we, we anticipate there probably will be because we're in the discovery process now. And uh, once the, uh, all the witnesses are deposed by Mr. Dornan and by Ms. Sanchez, if she wishes to uh, take depositions and subpoena people, mm -hmm. then we will have to analyze that. But it's, yeah, I guess the answer is if, if we don't have further hearings, it's good news for you because that means we decided there's no case and we act on motion to dismiss. But I, the I, look, I look forward to no further hearings because yeah. we're very confident. Right, but no, but the real process is that we would have another meeting to analyze everything, then decide whether to have further hearings either here or Washington and then make a final disposition of the case. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will turn to Mr. Hoyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think you would want to have Ms. Uh, Sanchez, Congressman Sanchez, answer this, but uh, we're going to try to deal with the facts here. Ultimately, this case is going to be decided, hopefully, on the facts. There have been a lot of allegations made. Let me refer specifically to the uh, affidavit of one Lance Powers, who apparently was uh, in attendance at the White House restaurant. Uh, it says the White House restaurant. I'm not sure. Uh, there is a restaurant called T the White House. -E. That's in Anaheim. I'm familiar okay. with it. I live in Anaheim. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the affidavit? Yes, I am. Uh, would you want to have Ms. Sanchez tell us what happened? I would be glad to let her tell you. I know it myself, but I think it would be probably best coming from her. Well, on the date in question with respect to that affidavit, I, in fact, did go to dinner at the White House in Anaheim, I believe, with five other gentlemen, um, and one of them being my husband, of course. And um, we were, I was discussing a story from earlier that day. In fact, a story because, as so many people know, I walked door to door to win this election. I had gone out that morning, a Sunday morning, in fact, accompanied by a reporter for one of the local newspapers. And I came across a gentleman who spoke Spanish. I'm sure he spoke English, but he preferred to speak in Spanish to me. 
And he said to me on my arrival at his door, oh my God, I just saw you this morning on television. And in fact, I had been that morning on a television talk show. And he said, you know, this is the first time I'm going to vote. I became a citizen about six months ago, and I've received my sample ballot. I don't know about other states, but here in California, you receive a sample ballot about 30 days ahead of time. It actually shows you what the ballot will look like. You also receive another supplementary that discusses the issues, the pros and cons on everything that will be on the ballot. And he said, where would I go to vote? And I said to him, do you have your sample ballot? Because on the back of the sample ballot is the polling spot. He went back into the home. I stood with the reporter. She was looking on. I explained to her what was going on. He came back and, in fact, could not find his sample ballot. And he said, I can't find it. I said, well, what you need to do is take down this number. I gave him the registrar's number and call. Let her know where you live, and you can get the address of where you should show up on November 5th to vote. He said, how would I fill out my absentee ballot? Because, of course, or his ballot, it wasn't an absentee ballot, my ballot, because, of course, he had never voted before. And I, I took a piece of paper that I had in my hand, which was an 8 and a half by 11, folded it in half and said, the ballot looks somewhat like this. I said, now the first ballot that you will have will say, for the President of the United States. And it will list five or six names that are on the election this time. And I said to him, in front of the reporter, now, who would you like to vote for, Clinton or Clinton? And he said, of course, I would love to vote for Clinton. And I said, well, then you would press through on that card. I said, the next election is the election, in fact, for the 46th Congressional District, my election. I said, there are five names. I listed off the names. I said, who would you like to vote for? And he said, Sanchez or Sanchez? I said, that sounds good. I said, in that case, you would put through your, you would put a mark on there or take out, you know, punch out the place. I said, now remember, on the back side of that ballot will be another election and further elections. And I cautioned him that he should read all the supplementals and find his sample ballot, fill it out ahead of time, go to the poll so he could then do it correctly. And in fact, that was the story that I was relating that evening at the White House. And Lance, who should have been serving my dinner, was obviously doing other things. But that is what happened uh, with that particular uh, discussion. Thank you. Mr. Aiken? Um, yes, Congressman. Uh, what would be illegal about that? Absolutely nothing. So. What would you think this affidavit would show? It would show absolutely nothing, and I'm embarrassed that a lawyer would even file it. The uh, 9,200 records uh, referred to, and you heard perhaps my questions, uh, which are referred to as clients, although I think in the response, uh, Mr. Hart uh, responded, or perhaps Mr. Schroeder, that obviously clients could have received a number of services. Do you know of voters, of registrations of Herman Dodd beyond the 1,100 and some odd that are in question? No, because there is a pr procedure by with the registrar where they check out uh, these registration ballots. And the 1160 was discovered because they went to this book that showed that certain, they checked every Herman, Herman Dodd. Um, a registration that was checked out, and they're all numbered, and then they check those registrations to see which of those numbers were returned to determine who actually was registered. Because as you know, uh, Congressman, many people check out boxes and boxes of registration cards. Campaigns are ambitious. They think they're going to go out and register 5,000 new voters. They check out 5,000 registration cards. They sit in the box. They hope they find a volunteer someday who will help them register, and most of those things are never, ever returned. In this case, they had the numbers checked out. That's how they, de they determined the 1160 number. So there would be no other registrations out there. And so the 9,200 figure is totally misleading and inappropriate. So that, in fact, the universe, from your perspective, is the 1,100. The only universe we've been able to discover, and that includes the district attorney and the secretary of state, and are doing the work for Mr. Dornan for him, is the universe of the 1160. Now, with respect to the 303 to which you referred in your uh, statement, you indicate that that number has been reduced as a result of your uh, interviews and investigation of those 303. 
Right. You recall I asked Mr. Schroeder, I believe, about specific names. I want to, I am sympathetic to both Mr. Hart's and Mr. Schroeder's concern about exposing individuals who, who may well have been confused uh, and may well have been misled. Let me accept that. However, uh, these 303 at least are identified in terms of names so that we, uh, as the committee or yourselves, can look at the veracity of the allegation or the truthfulness of, uh, of the allegation. You say you checked those 303, and then you... As best we could. I mean, I uh, to make it very clear, we had the 303 compared against the voter rolls. Uh, we could identify certain names. We went out and tried to contact these individuals. Some, of course, we were able to contact. Others, we were not. Now, the thing I want to... You have reduced the number, as I understand it, to approximately 70 of those who are still in question. That's Does correct. that mean that you have eliminated 233 from your perspective? From our perspective, we have, but with the caveat, and I'm sure I'm, uh, since we've been discussing my mathematical skills, uh, let's assume that my error rate uh, is, uh, percentages are correct. Uh, we, what we do is we find, for instance, in one group, they, we found that six out of seven, in fact, were registered, were citizens, out of, out of one of the various categories. So what we saw there was about an 80 whatever percent <laughs> error rate. And so if you took that number and projected it out for the other numbers we didn't contact and did, did that kind of mathematics, you would get into the area of 70 votes that appear to be the votes. And of course, and with one other caveat, uh, there's been the discussion regarding these voters who in fact uh, voted at the time they were citizens. I included in our number those people who registered before they were citizens, but in fact voted after they were citizens. And as a lawyer, that is a very open question as to whether or not those in fact were constitutional votes, irrespective of whether or not it met the uh, state standard. So I included that 121 votes, as I recall, uh, in that category as well. So if you buy, so if you do not buy into that these people who were citizens and who voted when they were citizens, had the right to do so, you would add that number to the, to the 70 and you'd be up to about 100 and, what, 190 approximately. I understand. Uh, essentially an extrapolation based upon uh, uh, your presumptions as opposed exactly. to counting each one of the 200. But we have clearly identified number of individuals who are in that 303 category who, who, who are in the category of being non-citizens who in fact who were citizens. I understand. I have a short time remaining. Uh, I am concerned about the uh, uh, discussions about Ms. Lever's uh, deposition. Uh, I was present, and I think her deposition was incredibly misrepresented to this committee. If you're going to give her an opportunity to respond to that, fine. If Since not, the I'm committee did not give it to us, we're going to give up some of our time. In, in well, I will battle. ask her the question now. Or, 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 uh, no, I will give up my time now if you want to talk to. I would like Ms. Lever then, if she would at this point in time, to respond to the issue related to either the 60 or other items that were mentioned. Particularly, I, I think, the 460 figure, which comes up and up and up again. The, and the 460 figure. I'll be glad to yield to uh, Ms. Lever. Ms. Lever, you may take the, uh, the stand. You've previously been sworn in. Thank you, Mr. I, um, I do ask you to try to keep your answer reasonably brief. First of all, the deposition that was taken I have not seen, I have not signed the transcript from the deposition. Um, also, my deposition was taken on April 14th, not six days ago on April 13th. Uh, we've talked over and over again. <laughs> we certainly do run you one day off, don't we? <laughs> but that's right, you held the election on the 6th. <laughs> no, I held it on the 6th. Um, there were originally, from Mr. Dornan's, Mr. Bill Hart's letter, uh, Mr. Dornan's attorney's letter originally, there were, uh, it, which I, all of you have copies of, there were 460, what we felt were keying errors at that time, data entry errors of keying the rosters, they were system errors, key, data errors. What led us to conclude that was that 222 precincts? 222 precincts. So that would be about one and a third per precinct. A little more, one and a 1.4 or something like that. 
You think I'm going to jump into that number? <laughs> yes, that's correct. Right. Um, we came to that conclusion again. Actually, it'd be a factor of two. <laughs> We, we came to that conclusion after we verified a handful of rosters, uh, about a half a dozen of them. And on every one of those, every one of five of those rosters, there were keying errors, one, two, three. On one of those rosters, there was an error where two full pages of voters' names had not been keyed into the system. Then afterwards, um, we began working on this reconciliation that, and, and I will state to you. And may I, I stop you, but just so we understand. What you're saying is that although the numbers were counted, the names were not keyed into your tape so that it appeared that more voters counted than you had names for. Is that correct? It, it appeared, uh, the voter participation file, again, we, we were. Tr this is a campaign tool. It is not something we oh, use. But we were trying to justify the numbers on that tape. That tape is not the official record of the election in any way, shape, or form. We have since gone back, and uh, I believe that um, on, in my deposition, if you go further into my deposition, the way I never lied in my deposition, as has been alleged, <coughs> Um, there is testimony in my deposition that says that we were in the process of, of, of reconciling where those 460 voter records were. My staff put together, finished uh, on uh, Thursday, I believe that was the 17th, putting together this reconciliation that I have provided to your committee and to both campaigns. Um, of where actually every signature is, which ones were keyed incorrectly. We've listed the names. So now if anybody dumps that voter participation file and takes that thick package that we gave you, it says which names were incorrectly stated on that voter participation file, which names were not even on the file, and it reconciles that entire voter participation tape to within 14 voter records not 14 ballots, 14 voter records of participation. I, I'm, I'm com and that was what was in my, um, in my, uh, my testimony this morning. I will also add that the numbers that Mr. Schroeder, the questions regarding the numbers that Mr. Schroeder was testifying to were never asked of me during that deposition. We asked Mr. Hart repeatedly all day yesterday, my counsel requested to get copies of what they had submitted to your committee. And as of this moment, we still have not received response from Mr. Dornan's attorneys. Well, I, I, we are quite over time on, uh, on your response here and the gentleman's time has expired. I, we, we do have the attachment that you attached to uh, your testimony this morning, even though you didn't give it, and I did read it earlier, and I suspect the other members of the panel did as well. If there, is there anything urgent that you have to add to that? No. And you, and you will be given an opportunity. If you wish, you can write uh, to us with any points that you feel you have not cleared up here, and I assume you will have an opportunity to review the deposition uh, and, uh, before you sign it. Uh, yeah, I would hope so. I do have the deposition. It was delivered to me on Thursday sometime. I have been preparing for this hearing. I have not had a chance to even open the envelope, let alone look at it. So you will have the opportunity to correct things for the record, and that's the main thing. Yes, sir. Is, there, is that a uh, sufficient answer for you, Mr. Hoyer? Uh, yes, uh, she can respond to the 60, which I think she responded to accurately on January 17th and equally accurately in the deposition. It seems to me that the there was a consistent response. Fine, and you will have another opportunity after the next presentation. Apparently, you will be testifying again. Uh, the, Mr. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Um, 
the Nick gentleman from Ohio. Ohio. I should call you that <laughs> once, once in a while, just to be polite. <laughs> You're gentleman supposed to be Ohio. Republican with memory like an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question, if I could. You know how those businesses are, Bob. <laughs> That's right. One question of Mrs. Sanchez, if I could. Yeah, okay. one, one question. One question. As far as the involvement in, you know, of uh, your campaign with Armana Dodd or any of the groups that were registering people to vote, was there any type of activity with the campaigns or communications? Not at all. We did not even really, we did not even hold a registration drive within our own campaign because we did not have the resources and we really had no under goings on of what was happening out there uh, with respect to registration. Ours was a persuasive campaign. So the campaign did not have communications and coordinations? Uh, we met one time with um, Southwest Voter Registration. They told us that they were going to be in the area and they would be registering. Uh, they're a nonprofit. Uh, we told them, go out and do it. You know, uh, that's about it. But with respect to Hermandad or, um, you know, I don't even know who was out there doing a registration effort. Again, we focused, we had so little resources and volunteers, we really focused on our campaign and doing our persuasive campaign and walking our door to door. Thank you. I have a question, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ake. Um, in your reality, number one, just out of curiosity, the headline uh, up there was, Massive attempt at election fraud by Bob Dorn and his Washington cronies. Who are the Washington cronies? Who are specifically the Washington cronies? Uh, we just know that he went back to Washington and had a lot of meetings. Uh, I didn't name them because I don't want to throw out names uh, uh, in regards to that. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the uh, other question I had, according to Secretary of State Jones, uh, there were 303 illegal votes potential legal votes cast, you referred to six errors. Do you know of more than six errors or is it just six? No, there's more than six errors. There is a, there's a number of categories and I gave you some examples. Uh, of the 303 uh, votes that we are talking about, they're a combination of, of, of the people who voted uh, before uh, being sworn as, as citizens, those who voted uh, after uh, that, who became citizens but, uh, and voted bef after they were citizens. Mm -hmm. And his 303 figure, we then went out and analyzed, and he had a number of different numbers. He had the 69 in there, uh, which was the no notations, okay. and a number of different figures. So we went through the 303, registered, and then we talked to a number of individuals and came up with the various mm -hmm. error rates. And some of the people who were here today were listed as part of that 303 figure. Because this is such an important point, uh, do you want to take the opportunity and either today or at some point in time in the near future to provide the task force with any of the records of the interviews you've conducted to confirm it? Yeah, to I definitely support. think this is important information that obviously would be shared. We've asked those individuals to be here. A number of them have come. Uh, and there's other individuals and names of people we can identify for you that I have with me. And we will certainly lodge that with the committee and we will certainly make that available. Uh, the other question I had, you said we need all the evidence um, you know, to conclude this. And that's been said many times. So why should we not ask the INS for the list that, that Attorney Hart had wanted to determine how many non-U.S. citizens registered and voted to, to kind of take that piece of it and dispel it or? Well, it, it's not our position to tell this committee uh, what they may want to do in order to uh, consider in the future what they want to do about election activity. Our concern is this. Number one, we know for a fact just off the 303 that there's a significant error in the INS records. So we know for a fact that the records do not appear to be in a condition upon which they are reliable. You'll hear from Tony Miller who was the acting um, chief deputy secretary of state and chief counsel and then uh, the actual acting secretary of state before Mr. Jones took office who also wanted to do the same thing and found that the errors were such that there could not be the match that's being desired. So I can tell you our concern, and this committee can make its own decisions, but our concern is that if you do such a match for all of the citizens of Orange County, 
then I suggest you should do it from Michigan and Ohio and Maryland and everywhere else. And when you see all the errors that are going to come out of that match, then you're going to decide how much money and effort and time are you going to expend investigating whether it's a true error, whether it, are the well, registration records bad, Mr. are the Mr. INS Aiken, records Mr. bad, etc. Just reclaiming my time for a second here. Are you suggesting without anyone alleging fraud in the state of Ohio we should go through this? I'm saying that the, if you're trying to prove a point regarding the INS records and their accuracy of registration records, there's no reason, based on the evidence that's been presented to this committee, to single out 1.2 million citizens of Orange County. That's your policy decision and that's your expense. But I would not suggest that because of the 303 figure that has been put forth by Mr. Dornan, the citizens of Orange County be, should be subjected to that process. I want to but thank if you, you want to do it... Well, I, I, want to, I want to thank you for your permission with what Congress can do and your suggestions of what we can do. Uh, that enlightens me today. Well, I, uh, I hope let me so, ask, sir. Uh, I'm only delighted ask, to help. Uh, I, I know that. Let me ask another question. You made a statement towards the end of your presentation um, about, and you threw in the Constitution, but I think it went towards uh, the fact of and correct me if I'm wrong, you could register to vote prior to becoming a citizen and it would count under the Constitution? Was that? I think there is a very valid, legitimate, legal argument that if someone registers to vote and becomes a citizen prior to that vote, you are, you are classifying, if you're 17 years of age, you can go ahead and register even though you can't vote. We've, we've made a decision in California pursuant to law to say that even though you can register when you're 16, as long as you don't vote when you're 18, you can't register as a non-citizen even though you wait till the time that you're a citizen to vote. And, I, and there is authority for the proposition in two ways. And, and, and Mr. Miller will address this subject. So Mr. Miller, the former acting Secretary of State, that there is a constitutional argument that if you have registered and you have become a citizen prior to voting, even though after you registered, that vote, you may well have the constitutional right to vote because the Constitution takes precedent over whatever the individual procedures are that are outlined in the various states. So I think that's a very open question, and that's what I was referring to. Because well, that disputes earlier feelings of, I think, Mrs. Lever and the Secretary of State. Of, which happens. Are, are you suggesting, sir, that lawyers disagree about what the law is? Oh, no. Uh, no more than members it's of a different, Congress do. Uh, certainly it's a different yeah. opinion than Mr. Jones's. Uh, so then I would take it that if, if for example, hypothetically, uh, you have an illegal, uh, or if, if you have a, a, a person who is not a citizen, they have filled out the uh, form to become a registered voter, and therefore you wouldn't consider that fraud then under the California statute. I'm not speaking to whether it's uh -huh. fraud for purposes of, you, you must make the distinction between whether or not someone is subject to criminal prosecution for making a false statement and their vote. There's a real separate issue there. So I'm certainly not encouraging anyone to make a false statement. I'm just saying that if somebody votes and they are constitutionally authorized to vote, there's a legal question as to whether that vote should be counted or not. And we're certainly not in any way suggesting that people shouldn't candidly and honestly file uh, and sign declarations. We're just talking about whether these votes should or should not be counted. And, and there's a great deal of support for our position, and there's a great deal of support for the opposite position. And that issue, at some point, will be clarified. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, with my remaining time, I'd just like to make a personal privilege for a statement. Uh, um, thank you, Mr. Hagan. Sure. Uh, just for, I think, edification here, this is not uh, the Indiana McCloskey McIntyre race where uh, uh, a member, a person came to the United States Congress and presented a certificate from the uh, Secretary of State and was not seated. Uh, when Mrs. Sanchez came to the United States Congress, we seated her. So I think that in itself took a lot of the, of the politics out of it. And I know this is emotional for people and this is tough and a lot of rhetoric goes out there. But I just also want to explain because I, I feel the overtones of a lot of, of partisanship here that in no way have I as my colleague Mr. Ehlers prior to today talked with Mr. Dornan, nor his attorneys, nor with Mrs. Sanchez about this issue. So try to be fair as humanly possible. Uh, but I, I would just say that one question that Mr. Aiken asked this committee that I find disturbing 
uh, because this is a congressional committee that has followed the rules, unlike Indiana. And one thing I find to be disturbing is the fact that the question asks, how can we accept Mr. Dornan's statements? Now, no matter how much one may like Mr. Dornan's statements or not like Mr. Dornan's statements, things are accepted whether people like them or not. Uh, as an Irish Catholic born poor Republican, I can accept a tasteless joke into this record or a tasteless stereotype. So that's how we do it. It's called the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ney. And that uh, concludes this presentation and the questions thereon. We will take a 10 minute break and then we'll go to the response by both contestant and contestee. 10 minutes, we are in recess. meeting will come to order. It's been a long day. I know uh, everyone's getting a little tired, but uh, we'll try to keep things moving rapidly. We have another two hours to go. The rest of the remainder of the afternoon will be spent first with a response by the contestant for 30 minutes, followed by five minutes per member of questions, and then response by the contestee for 30 minutes with five minutes per member for question. And that will be followed, as I said earlier, by uh, approximately 30 minutes of public comment from representatives of six organizations who are interested in our activities. We're having a slight problem with our timer, so we will time it according to my wristwatch until uh, the timer is repaired. Mr. Hart, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. At this time, uh, uh, contestant Robert K. Dornan uh, calls uh, for testimony. Uh, Mr. Nelson Molina, uh, a resident of the 46th Congressional District. Nelson? Mr. Molina, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force on the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Would you state your name? Nelson Molina. Thank you. Proceed. Uh, Mr. Molina, I ask you to keep your voice up and speak into the mm -hmm. microphone for us so that we can all hear. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you live? In Anaheim. Is that in the 46th Congressional District? Yes. During the last election in 1996, were you uh, a supporter of Loretta Sanchez? I hope so, a little bit. Yes. Uh, is it true uh, that you, uh, you uh, actually participated in one of her uh, campaign ads as a uh, person who was in that ad? Yes. Okay. At, that, uh, a, a, at the present time, uh, uh, are, you you, are you a United States citizen? No, I know. How long have you been here in the United States? About 15 years. Okay. And can you tell us what your status is, your documented status? Uh, I permanent resident. I'm sorry. Say, uh, permanent. Uh, you know the green card. You're a permanent resident. Yes, yeah, I say. Okay. And uh, you've been and you've been a permanent resident for some time and employed here uh, in uh, Orange County. Yes, sir. And uh, do you live here with your family? Uh huh. And how many children do you have? I got four kids and my wife. And she's here with you today as well. Yes. Now, can you relate to us, uh, if you would, whether you're acquainted with a fellow by the name of Benny Hernandez? Yes, uh, he the one that introduced me to uh, Loretta, and he went to my home about three weeks, you know, before the, the election, and he bring the sign, he told me if I can help you out. Let me get, he brought a sign. Yes. And he wanted, did he want you to put the sign in your front yard? Right. Did you say that was okay? That's okay. All right. And he and asked me if I got a truck, you know, and later for help you out, put a sign. Okay. He asked if you had a truck to help out. Right. Okay, and you were going to put out some signs for him, right? Right. This is for the Loretta Sanchez campaign for Congress, correct? Yes. Did you understand that Mr. Hernandez worked for Loretta Sanchez? Yes, it, what he told me. Okay. Now, at some point in time in your home in Anaheim, California, did Mr. Hernandez, this employee or worker for Loretta Sanchez, uh, tell you whether or not, first of all, did he, did he ask you whether you were a citizen or a non-citizen? 
No, what he said to me is, uh, you bought? And I say, no, I can't because I only, you know, I got my green card. But my wife, if she already bought for you, she bought in the mail. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me back that. He asked you if you voted. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And you said that you had not voted because you had a green card. Because I came. And you knew you could not vote because you were not a U.S. citizen. Right. And he told me, why not? They're not going to see you. Who's yeah. not going to see you? And what he said to me, why not? You can go to the poll and, and register. They're not going to ask you nothing. They, they, they don't see you. They, they wouldn't know who you were? And I introduced it to my wife, and I said to her, she's, I said to him, she's white, and she already born in the mail. And he said, uh, okay, let me, let, me, let me stop you there. You, you pointed to your wife and said that she had already voted. Yeah, she walked into the door and I said, this is my wife, is you ready to give me the, the vote to you guys? So, so, so she, your wife, you indicated your wife had already voted for Loretta Sanchez? Yes. By absentee ballot? Yes, uh, correct. And this conversation took place in your living room? No, in, fr in the front of the door. Okay. Because I, wa I was working in my car. And did you, what did you tell Mr. Hernandez when he suggested that you should go down and vote even though you were a non-citizen? I told him that came, the but with my wife, she already bought. Okay. And he asked my wife, how you bought? And my wife told him, no, I bought absentee. And he said, you can buy again. You can go to the, to the poll. Okay. So he suggested that your wife go to the polls and vote a second time, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he knew that she had already voted for Loretta Sanchez by absentee ballot? Yeah, what did she tell him? Okay. And uh, what did your wife respond uh, in your she, presence? She, she told him no. Okay. Now... Have you related this, uh, this, uh, the, the facts of this uh, event uh, to us as accurately as you possibly can? Have you told us, told us the truth in every respect? Oh, on the bottom of my heart, it's the truth before God. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Molina. You're welcome. Is it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we would call uh, Ms. Jana Carty. Uh, to the, to the stand. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just ask a question? Will we be able to recall Mr. Molina asking questions? At the conclusion of uh, this 30 minutes, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I help do. you, God? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. You heard uh, uh, Mr. Molina uh, relate uh, what happened uh, prior to the election in 1996, correct? Yes. Okay. Are, are you Mr. Molina's wife? Yes. All right. And uh, you and he have four children in Anaheim and reside there, correct? Yes, we do. And uh, uh, sometime before the election in November 96, uh, did you have occasion to have a discussion with a Mr. Benny Hernandez, an, a worker for uh, the Loretta Sanchez campaign? Yes, I did. All right. And uh, would you just simply relate uh, what, uh, what occurred at that time? to us. Just tell us what happened. Okay. Um, they, they had a conversation outside before they came to the door. You and, and your husband? So or or she, he, and, her, he and, and your husband? Yeah, right. All right. And when he came to the door, he had introduced me and he had asked me if I had voted and I told him, yes, I voted absentee. I voted for Benny and for Loretta. Oh, Benny was running for election too? Yeah, for the union district or something. Okay. And um, he had mentioned to me if I had registered with the polls. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you could go over there and vote. I said, no, I can't do that because I already voted. Okay. That and what did, what did he say in response to that? What did he say in response to that you'd already voted? He knew you'd already voted, yeah. correct? Right. Well, he had asked me, yeah. yeah. And notwithstanding that, he told you to go to the polls and vote because your name would already be on right, the polls. Right, on the list. And I already told him, no, I can't because I already mm -hmm. voted. All right. I have no further questions. Thank you. At this time, we would call uh, Mr. James Humble Sanchez, a special agent for the INS. <clears throat> Mr. Humble Sanchez, would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, uh, what is your present occupation? I'm a special agent with the INS. Uh, I'm assigned to the Los Angeles District Office. And how long have you been with the INS? Uh, I'm going on 10 years now. Uh, would you say that you are very familiar with their databases for, that retain information on uh, 
uh, uh, persons uh, uh, who the INS is uh, interested in maintaining information on? Uh, yes, I've used their uh, databases on a daily basis. Okay. Now, uh, contestant Robert Dornan served on the INS a subpoena earlier uh, that sought various uh, data information from the INS. And there has been some question here in this hearing as to how accurate uh, those databases are if we were to run them uh, in a very comprehensive way uh, against the uh, list of persons who voted in the 46th district. Have you heard that uh, issue raised? Yes, I've heard that testimony. All right. And we asked in our subpoena for, uh, and I've already mentioned these, so I'm just going to touch on them because I know you know what the acronyms are. The NACS uh, uh, database, the NITS database, the CIS database, the AFACS, I'm sorry, AFACS database, uh, the ASBI database, the CCAIMS database, and the DATS or DATS database. Are you familiar with all of those? Uh, yes, I am. All right. And have you used all of those databases and are you familiar with their, generally familiar with their use and accuracy? At one time or the other, I have. Yes. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you based on your experience. In the event that the committee uh, and we, in a, in a confidential setting, had access to these databases and that they were, and they were run by experts like yourself and, and, and perhaps others at the INS against the voted take, would this be of assistance to us in determining whether or not non-citizens voted in the district? Yes, it would. Uh, we commonly use these databases to, to grant benefits. So their accuracy is, is to a level that the agency relies upon those databases. Okay. Would you say that it running those databases together or in sequence would pick up uh, uh, the, by far the vast majority of, uh, of names of persons who might have voted uh, uh, as non-citizens, uh, registrants, or voters uh, in that district? Y yes, it would. Uh, the databases, most of them are not linked. Uh, they're non-relational. They're flat file, but a, uh, one or two of them are. So you'd have to run almost all of them to be global or inclusive of all our records. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let me ask you, ask you this. Does the INS uh, work with so-called CBOs or community-based uh, based organizations, uh, which are sort of outreach organizations in connection with, with citizenship classes and naturalization efforts? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, and uh, are some of those uh, organizations Catholic Charities, One Stop Immigration, uh, uh, and the like? Yes, they are. And are those, to your knowledge, are those based in the, what's called the L.A. District, which includes Orange County? Yes, they are. Uh, and Herman Dodd is another one of those organizations? Y yes, it is. All right. Now, routinely, does the INS provide information on, uh, that you have at the INS to these CBOs? Yes, uh, these CBOs are allowed to collect uh, what had prior to this time been uh, privacy right or FOIA uh, information protected. Uh, so these, uh, these outreach uh, organizations have been allowed to collect that data, and they're not subject to the same privacy right restrictions that INS would be. Uh, they can use these databases, uh, and they can use these information sheets uh, without any restrictions that would apply to uh, a government agency like INS. So in the event the INS were to say, theoretically, that, that these databases were absolutely uh, secure, that they're, that they're known only to the INS and that we can't release this data, that would not be an accurate uh, statement, correct? No, it wouldn't be accurate. A lot of the information that uh, these community-based organizations uh, have collected is duplicated in, in our files, in our records, and they have a duplicate file in the hands of these private organizations. And so if we sought by way of subpoena to these private organizations that are engaged in uh, naturalization or citizenship classes, we would uh, likely pick up one or more of those databases that were in their possession, correct? Uh, yes, you would. Uh, there, there's, they most likely would be reflected in one of our databases. All right. And so there would be a, that would be a good cross-check uh, between the databases, one, one that was with the uh, CBO and then one with the INS. Yes, it would be. Okay. Um, there has been some testimony, I'll jump for a moment, there's been some testimony here about uh, the 69 voters that we have described as probable non-citizen voters in the 46th district that were identified by the Secretary of State as the following, foreign-born persons without any record at the INS. Now, I want you to assume that they are Herman Dodd registrants, that is, persons Herman Dodd registered uh, who were taking citizenship classes within Herman Dodd at that time. What would be the most likely, most probable explanation for such a person? 
uh, that they're illegal aliens or possibly resident aliens that aren't reflected in our, in our databases. Okay. Uh, and, okay, fine. Uh, resi but either way, they'd be an alien. They would be an alien. All right. Now, with regard to that issue, have you, has it come to your attention that from time to time you've, you've learned that persons who are here, and I will call them undocumented aliens as opposed to documented aliens, if they were documented, they would be in the INS database, right? Yes, they by, should be. By definition. Right. But if they're undocumented, they wouldn't be, correct? True. And that's where we see that NR on those records, which is no record. Right, that, that means they, they, that, but the, the, the information that was given on that check, we didn't come up with a conclusive hit. W even cross-checking databases? I don't know if you got a cross-checking on the databases. I, I don't think uh, from what was given earlier by Mr. Rogers, the district director, right. it doesn't look like they cross-checked the, the indexes. Okay. Now, with regard to that situation, and I'm speaking of the 69 probable uh, undocumented uh, persons, have you heard of uh, undocumented people going through citizenship classes uh, or attending citizenship classes with, with these CBO groups? Uh, we've, we've, I've heard of it. The, the examiners that I've talked to or the adjudicators that I've interviewed said that, that they believe it had been taken place. Okay. I have no further... Well. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Good afternoon. There are two uh, areas that I want to devote the remaining time that we have. One is um, uh, ways in which I believe this evidence needs to be evaluated and considered, or what we would respectfully suggest the committee uh, w w ought to look at it. And the second is to respond to some of the points that were made uh, by Mr. Aiken and Ms. Sanchez. The committee is obviously faced with a difficult task, and one of the problems with whenever you deal with this situation is the, at the end of the day, you still don't have complete information. There will always be gray areas and ambiguities, and at least at some level the committee is going to be forced to weigh the issues of fairness, and it's going to be forced to decide between the competing testimony who should be given more weight and who's more credible. And it is in that light that I uh, raise, uh, I'm going to raise a series of issues and then, I, and then make responses. Um, it is the law in the state of California, and I believe across the country, that you don't have to live in a congressional district to run in it. It's usually preferable, but it's not a requirement. It is not, however, the law, at least in the state of California, that you may vote in a district on an improper registration. You must, uh, in order for a vote to be properly counted, you have, it has to be based on a proper registration, not an inaccurate or perjured uh, uh, affidavit. In this case, and we've documented at some length in the binder books that we turn out, there are two votes that at a minimum shouldn't be counted in this election, and that's Loretta Sanchez's and her husband, uh, Stephen Brixey. And the reason is, is that they registered to vote at 2206 Center Street in Anaheim. And if you look at tabs 40, not 44 and 49, and I've had some problems properly identifying my tabs, but I think those are the correct ones, you will see both of their registration seats in an indication that they both registered at, the, at, your res, at those residences. If you will then take a look at tab 46, you will see the home in Los Angeles County where they actually lived. Now, they certified under penalty of perjury that in fact they lived in those in, in, at 2206 Center Street and therefore were entitled to vote in the district. Now, why are we so sure that she has not lived there? Oh, oh, there we go. Let's take a look here. Um, why are we so sure that Loretta Sanchez lives in Los Angeles County rather than in Orange County? My co-counsel has corrected me. I, I did misread the card. The 2206 Center Street was the prior address. It's 12422 Woodbridge in Garden Grove. Well, the reason is is that um, 
we had an investigator um, interview the, the, the neighbors, and we subpoenaed the utility bills. Now, the utility bills disclosed that enough gas was used in that house to run the pilot light. That's it. Enough electricity was used to run the clocks. That's essentially it. And those items are documented in our papers. And the only phone listing is, in fact, in Los Angeles County. There is no phone listing in Orange County. And those phone listings are documented. So there is a maxim in the law that when you ask a, a, a body, be it judicial or quasi-judicial, to do justice and to do equity, you should come with clean hands. And in this case, that's not what we have here. We have two votes, at the very least, that need to be disallowed, and they are the contestees and her husbands. Now, let's look at the positions that have been set forth to the committee. One is, they came to the committee and looked, looked you all in the eyes and said that we've been sending subpoenas out to um, a variety of different groups, including um, fire departments and Vietnamese citizen groups and uh, all kinds of other groups. The problem with all that is that it's a complete lie. It's not true. The committee has copies of all of our subpoenas, and they know that that's not true. Um, you've also been told uh, that uh, that our papers indicate some sort of conduct relating to raiding trash cans, looking in windows, standing in doorways. Of course, that's all preposterous. It's not true. And when you weigh the, when you decide what weight to give to the rest other testimony, keep in mind that they came in and they said that, and it is in fact a lie. Now, they also came in and presented what has essentially been their position for quite some time, which is that there simply is no evidence. Well, no reasonable person believes that anymore. The fact of the matter is, there clearly is evidence. And while I, I am somewhat shuddered to try to in, engage in talking about percentages in light of what happened to opposing counsel, um, I believe that the margin of victory in this race was approximately uh, nine-tenths of one percent. So when they talk about three-tenths of one percent as being something that should be ignored and insignificant, the very preliminary indication is already documented somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of the total margin of victory. So it is very, very significant. And Loretta Sanchez says she doesn't know if a, if a 0.5 percent uh, fraud rate is acceptable. She'll defer to the registrar. Well, I think everybody in this room knows the answer to that question except Loretta Sanchez. And that is, in this race, 0.5 percent, and I admit I'm, I'm a history major, but I'm going to make a leap. I believe that's 500 votes. And I think 500 people engaging in fraud is a lot of fraud. And I think everybody else in this room does too. And I think that's an unacceptable level. Now, another thing that was suggested is that all the registrations that Herman Dodd engaged in have been gone through. That's not true. The fact is that we only know of the cards that Herman Dodd checked out in their own name. And the fact of the matter is, you don't have to check out cards in your own name. You can pick them up at the DMV or the post office. They're not checked out at all. We also know that 12,000 people were registered, I mean, sorry, 12,000 people went through Herman Dodd's citizenship classes in the last two years. It is quite possible that all of them were registered. We don't know that. We won't know until the INS does what we all need to have them do so we can get this matter resolved. But it is possible they were all registered and they all voted and, it, and there wouldn't be cards checked out. In fact, if you look at the return to search warrant affidavit, there's indications that uh, of cards that in fact weren't checked out in Herman Dodd's name. They were checked out in Nativa Lopez's name, they were checked out in his wife's name, they were checked out in employee's name. The only way we're going to know for sure is if we run the list. The, um, one of the other points that was made is, well, you know, um, we haven't gathered all of the evidence. That we, didn't we haven't talked to every single person who um, was uh, possibly engaged in voter fraud. Well, let me read something to the committee. It's short, but I think it, it bears um, hearing. Herman Dodd put out an, um, a piece into the 46th Congressional District saying, last week we advised the people of our community to refuse to answer any questions from anyone regarding the election, and we offered to obtain legal representation for anyone in the Latino community who felt he or she was being threatened or intimidated. That's right. We have had trouble talking to some of the people in the district. And the reason is, is Nativa Lopez and Loretta Sanchez have been doing everything they can to convince people not to talk to us. So in light of that, it's not surprising that there are some people in the district that we've been able to talk to. In addition, Loretta Sanchez's chief of staff, uh, Steve Yaust, 
has been very public in the papers indicating that he has contacted people that have been, received the subpoenas and told them not to comply with the subpoenas. Let's talk about this 81 percent error rate or whatever the heck they're talking about. First off, you're being asked to weigh the credibility of, on the one hand, the Secretary of State, the INS, and the District Attorney. On the other hand, Loretta Sanchez and her supporters uh, on this issue of voter fraud. The fact is, if you talk to, they claim they talked to seven people essentially, and six of them didn't come out right, and therefore they, we can dismiss the entire thing. That's not true. That doesn't make any sense. The committee has the clear things from, um, uh, from um, uh, the government agencies as to what happened. The final thing that I want to cover on the evidence is that it has been suggested to this committee that it is somehow acceptable to register to vote when you're a non-citizen, even though that's felony behavior. And even though I don't think anyone contests that it's not felony behavior. And then your vote should be allowed later. Well, if you look at tab three, there is an actual registration card. And it's been suggested that there might be an ambiguity because there's a thing about registering before you're 18, as long as you be 18 on election day. Well, it's not ambiguous. If you look in the upper right-hand corner of that registration card, it says, I will be, in other words, in the future, at least 18 years old on or before the next election. I'm not in prison. And then skip down to the next, um, um, see. oh, and it says, I am a US citizen, present tense. There's no ambiguity in those. And, there, and, and I think the suggestion that people could engage in um, the conduct of, of, of coming into the elector, electoral system by committing a felony and that, that should, those should be votes that we accept in this election, I think is absolutely outrageous. I mean, the thing that has been missing here from the start is any kind of a statement by Loretta Sanchez that this kind of conduct is improper or any kind of support for getting to the bottom of this thing. The fact is that this election was tampered with. It cuts to the heart of our system. She should have the same concerns uh, that we do about it, and we should get, get on to either having a new election or having the results overturned. I very much thank the committee for the time and attention. Mike, I want to make a short close. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Dorman. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to briefly uh, make a close today. I'm very proud of my lawyers. They were up against uh, a lot of stonewalling in November and December and still to this day. And they threw out a broad net trying to uh, all of us get first an MA and then a PhD in uh, post-election shenanigans and in voter fraud. I don't think there are four people in this room, not four, discounting your staff who studied the election and Ms. Lever and her, Mrs. Lever and her team, and the lawyers that know the following facts that I'm going to present to you. Nobody in the media knows it. Nobody. Mrs. Sanchez has rented apartment that was just discussed, and her still open campaign headquarters and her federal headquarters are all in Garden Grove, where I've paid a mortgage, I repeat, for 13 years. Garden Grove by 3,000, almost 400 votes, almost 3,400 votes. She said she went to grade school here, out of the district in northern Anaheim, and high school out of the district in northern Anaheim. And if that's her hometown, and she changed her name, dropped her married name to win her hometown, which is her answer, well, isn't it funny that I won Anaheim by 1,344 votes? I won every single precinct in the parts of other cities we have, Orange, Tustin, those Marines all did vote for me at the helicopter base, and Fountain Valley. I won all of the unincorporated areas, and I won all of the mail-in absentees by Mrs. Lever's count on election night. Now, if I'd been in Pennsylvania, that would have been it, because they count everything on election night. That's why our colleague, uh, John Fox, won with 10 votes on election night, and it stayed, went up to 100 or something. And then I asked Mrs. Lever to please separate the walk-in absentees from the mail-in absentees. She said, I can't, we've already blended them. But it turns out I won all, I won the majority of the mail-in absentees that came in on Monday and on election day up till poll closing. Where did I lose this if I carried a third of Santa Ana also? 
I lost it in the precincts right around this building. And I lost it by five to one, six to one, seven to one, eight to one. And I, uh, I have found areas where there was a 400 to 500 or higher percent increase in walk-in absentee ballots. Now, walk-in absentee ballots are not even allowed in Pennsylvania and some other states. If you're in town on election day and you're not in a hospital or incapacitated and you're not out of town, if you're seen in town, your ballot is discounted, your absentee ballot. I bet even Ros Lieber would like to see that law passed in California. If you walk in, they, they take your absentee ballot away from you, avoid it, and say, go vote in the booth, which isn't much to ask of a citizen. And I've looked at your laws in Maryland and Ohio and, and Michigan, and by recent count, I would still be the congressman in 11 of our states, Florida, Connecticut, Utah, a whole bunch of them because of the looseness of our process that you've already found remarkable, Mr. Chairman. So when I look at the walk-in absentee ballots and then think of my declaring victory on election night, tight by 233 votes, and it held for eight days, Ms. Lieber told my staff two days after the election, uh, Congressman Dorna will prevail. We've never had a, that higher race ever turned on absentee ballots. And that's what I thought, because in nine prior elections, I went up over a full percentage point, thousands of votes after election. But now we have these white and blue uh, motor voters that she's patiently trying to explain to me after the election and these walk-in absentee ballots. And where did this lie come from about Nicaraguan drug lords? Who dreamed that up? Yo, yo, Yost? Where did that lie come from? What Mrs. Sanchez said was that a group called Neighbor to Neighbor organized 500 troops, that was her word, troops, to squeeze out these walk-in absentees on election day, and we have discovered the perfect crime. Don't write brother-in-law on it or uncle or friend down the block or cousin. Just don't write anything on it. Commit a felony, walk in with somebody else's absentee ballot with their signature or one that's forged on it and turn it in, but don't have two signatures on it and you've committed the perfect crime. So I just wanted to get it straight that out of the precincts, and you have a different count now, you've combined precincts, but your precinct one precinct, I took that tied one in the recount. She won 105. So if this was an electoral college thing, I'd still be the congressman. I'm not moving to where my mother grew up in Wilkes-Barre. I'm going to stay here and fight. And then I may end up in broadcasting, and you'll all uh, have guests on my show if I don't prevail. But I think I'm going to prevail because one group, Mexican Brotherhood, is one group. And all the other groups, like the one that Mrs. Brooksy said she met with, Southwest Voter Project, they're going to come up with the same numbers. You watch. The time has expired. We will now turn to the question period. There will be five minutes per member for questions. Mr. Schroeder, would you uh, return to the stand, please? You, you made the comment, uh, Mr. Schroeder, that Ms. Sanchez and her husband have registered to vote in this district but do not reside in this district. I wonder if you could explain, for the benefit of the panel, what what the uh, nature of the residency requirements are in the state of California for registration to vote. And let me just give you an example. In Michigan, for example, uh, because of property tax rebates by the state and by lower property tax for, for your residence as opposed to other property you own, uh, we are required to list a principal residence upon which we get the property tax reduction. Uh, and that is also the same one that we uh, would have to use or should have to use for the registration address for voting purposes. Is there anything similar in California? Is there a definition in state law of the, uh, the, res the residence you have to have for your voting purposes? The, the, um, the definition in California, I think, I'm not familiar with the laws in your state, but it sounds like they're different. And the reason is, is that the test in California, they don't call it principal residence. Um, they, the test is domicile. And domicile is the, and, and, and my co-counsel was good enough to grab the statute for me, and it's section 349 of the elections code. Um, and it's the domicile of the person is that place in which his or her habitation is fixed, wherein the person has an intention of remaining into which whenever she is absent, the person has intention of returning. That is the, um, and at a given time, a person may have only one domicile. That's section 349. Uh, of the elections code, and um, that is the definition. 
Now, in this case, um, so you so you, ha you you can't simply pick a place out of the air that you don't live in, that you've never lived in, and you don't have any intention of living in. And in this case, um, we went to some degree of, of, of effort before we were willing to, to make this claim to, to in fact document that, that, that she simply doesn't live there and never has. Right. So now you've explained what under California law is uh, constitutes a domicile. Does the election law state that that has to be the address from which you register to vote? Absolutely. In fact, uh, in this county, the, in the, as a result of uh, an election here, there was a, a woman who was prosecuted for two felonies for exactly that issue because she registered at a, at a location which the district attorney did not feel that she had sufficient connection with. And, and, and you cannot list as your resident, you, you, you have to list, because you're doing it under penalty of perjury in your affidavit, you have to accurately list your residence or the registration's no good. Are there other uh, laws governing residences or relating to residence? For example, do you have city income taxes here whereby you have to claim a principal residence? for purposes of taxation? There, um, in California, at least fortunately, because we're largely a Republican state, we don't have city income taxes. Um, we have other things um, like property taxes, and you do get a, a, an exemption for your, um, for your principal residence there. That is one of the things we hope to learn more about when, if Ms. Sanchez actually honors the subpoena that she's been served with at some point and shows up, we certainly intend to ask her what place she claimed uh, as her principal residence for tax purposes. But there is no, there are, there are no city uh, uh, income right. taxes at But there time. is something in other, other tax law by which you define your principal residence. Yes, sir, there is. Fine. I have uh, no further questions at this time. I'll reserve the balance of my time and turn to the gentleman from Maryland. The law in California, Mr. Schroeder, is, uh, am I correct, that uh, if Ms. Schroeder tells you now that her domicile is at the dress uh, that she states, uh, that is conclusively presumed under California law to be her domicile, is it not? It is conclusively presumed for the purpose of running for the office. There's no exemption in there that allows you to commit perjury because you're signing under penalty of perjury uh, as to what your uh, residence is for the purpose of voting. And there is a difference between the, there's a difference between what you're presumed to do for the purposes of holding the office versus the purposes Mr. of Schroeder, registering. without being convoluted, I understand what you're saying. The fact of the matter is you have to be domiciled in the place where you vote, correct? Yes. Secondly, if you brought this issue up, I take it, within the last 60 days. I know it was a campaign issue. Well, I was not at all involved in the campaign, unlike Mr. Aiken, but um, it's certainly been you're raised. Cha you're chairman of the Republican Party of the state of California, Mr. Schroeder? I am now. I was not at the time of the election, but I was not involved in this particular did, campaign. Did you get to be chairman by being uninvolved in elections? <laughs> <laughs> that is a no. unique selection. Yeah, I, I, did, I, 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 did, I got there by being somewhat selective in which ones I did get involved I in. I got you. My point... <laughs> My point is, the Chairman asks you, are there other laws? As I understand it, uh, 2026, uh, Section 2026 of the California Code makes it a conclusive presumption if Ms. Sanchez, Congresswoman Sanchez, tells you she is domiciled at X address, the law says she's domiciled at X address, does it not? Right, I have this section right in front of me. Does it say that? As I indicated to you before, that's Clear and unambiguously, as you referred to the voter uh, registration form? Um, I interpret it differently than you do, with all due respect, uh, sir. I interpret, the, and uh, my understanding of this section is that has to do with the conclusive presumption for the purposes of running for office. Because otherwise, you know, when, as soon as you're elected, you have two residences, and someone could always say, well, you know, you really live in Washington rather than living in California. Or you really, if you're a legislator, you really live in Sacramento rather than living in your district. That's my understanding of the section. And it certainly doesn't have an exemption in there for perjury. In other words, it doesn't make you immune from perjury if, in fact, you lied, and, in fact, you don't live there. <laughs> what it says is you can't lie. It says if you say <laughs> this, that's, what, that's the truth. That's what it says pretty clearly to me. I it says it's conclusively presumed. Period. I understand your position, Conclusively. Sir. What does con I don't want to quibble with it. Conclusively means you can't say nay. Right. I, I, I just understand that you're, you're deemed not to have lied, even though, though you did, for the purposes of running for office, not for the purposes of registering. 
I understand. Uh, I have no further questions. Thank you. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Ney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question of uh, Mr. Uh, Sanchez. Just a clarification, uh, Mr. Hoyer did not yield back his time. He reserved the balance of his time. You may question, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The question I had was concerning uh, phrase I think you used it was flat flat filed yeah flat uh, a flat file database sir could you just uh, briefly go over uh, how that works in this and the angle I was interested in was the fact that you had stated you and I forget all the acronyms that were used but you need you couldn't just pick out one you needed all of those different types of categories to comprehensively look at it. In other words, it just wasn't one tape. You needed all of them. I think that was your statement. Can you just explain that a little bit for us? Well, the Office of Information Resource Management, which describes all our databases, for the purpose of adjudications, which is where the databases are that contain the information on naturalization, we have 33 related, uh, we have 33 databases, of which about six are critical that would contain the information uh, that would determine uh, alienage or citizenship. And those databases are not related. And by related means, normally if you make a change in one relational database, it makes changes in across the board to the other databases. That's not the case with INS. Uh, I, I only think a, a very minor few are related. So a change in one is represented in changes in others. So it's possible to have an individual or an alien uh, in one database, in actually in five, six different databases, duplications of the same person. Like uh, we've, we've got people that we've naturalized that we had under deportation orders. In other words, warrants of arrest, and we naturalized them. We have people that we naturalized that we had uh, uh, outstanding uh, federal warrants. Uh, and that we've had people that had state, county, and city warrants. But because the citizenship process was so flawed, and because there's different databases, that were not relational, you could have one represented in, in a deportation database where we have a, a warrant for them, but yet, in fact, we've also got them in a naturalization database where we actually gave them citizenship. So you have to go through every database? Well, well not every one of them. Uh, some of the databases that we use in the, in the adjudication branch are, are more of an auditing purpose. They're not necessarily are they going to contain distinct information. But of the 33, there's, there's at least uh, six that I would call key databases that are going to contain the information. Uh, one would be the naturalization, but then again, we also have the deportation. If someone has an outstanding deportation order, then obviously that person's an alien. We, we, we try not to make a practice of deporting citizens. That's good. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Yeah, Thank I, you. I, I just would like to make one clarification, if not. It, it, the, the, testimony today was very succinct that we don't want to uh, uh, tolerate fraud in the election process, but nobody seems to be as concerned with fraud in the naturalization process. The naturalization process by which we made these individual citizens is severely flawed. It, it hits around somewhere between 8 and 10 percent. But once they become citizens, everybody seems to be concerned that we want a zero tolerance there. Why don't we have a zero tolerance when we make them citizens. Thank I you. I just responded. The task of the committee. Well, I, I, I understand I, it's outside sure. of it, I but I think, I think that it's, it's related. Point, I, I, I'm, and I'm sorry to, to, but I need to think that point needs to be made. Oh, I appreciate you making that point. Uh, in closing, Mr. Chairman, I just also wanted to note, I, I was looking at one of the forms for voter registration and this whole question of citizen and when you note on the form, at the bottom, nobody has stated this today at least, says at the bottom, another checkpoint, are you a U.S. citizen? You answer yes or no. You check at the bottom. So unless I'm reading it wrong, at that point in time when you're filling this out, beyond what everybody has stated about the top portion, at the bottom you look at it and it says, are you a U.S. citizen, which would be at that point in time you check one of the, one of the two of them. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Ney. And I would just uh, a point of clarification to Mr. Uh, Humble Sanchez. Uh, the, the Congress is well aware of the point you raised, and although it's not in the jurisdiction of this group, it is being studied by the committee that does have jurisdiction. And I know from personal conversations they are very concerned about it and planning to pursue that. So I just wanted to reassure you on that score. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you very, very much. Uh, the contestant has concluded uh, our presentation today, and we very, very much appreciate your time and yeah. attention. Thank you. 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> that is important. 10 seconds, Mr. Donovan. All right, I can say it in 10 seconds. Mr. Aiken, the lead attorney, said all these people should be prosecuted. I called for amnesty four months ago. These people, innocent people, struggling for that dream to become citizens have been misled and had their citizens jeopardized. We don't want any part of prosecuting people unless it's shown that it's willful and deliberate. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Uh, Hoyer, did you wish to reclaim your, the time that you have not used? We'll next proceed to the response by the contestee for 30 minutes, followed by questions five minutes per member. Just like to um, quickly respond on the last point. I said if criminal activity is discovered, those individuals should be prosecuted. I certainly had never suggested that anyone who mistakenly or otherwise did not understand the process should be prosecuted. So hopefully I think the record will be uh, quite clear on that point. Uh, I would like to also at this point uh, turn it over to uh, my co-counsel, Mr. Wucher, who is going to present uh, one of the witnesses we have here for the benefit of the committee. Mr. Witcher, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, for the record, my name is Fred Wucher. Uh, there are two issues that I want to address. One is I want to just introduce another witness uh, that I'm quite confident I'm not committing any perjury and just do announcing somebody else's name here. Uh, but I will also be sworn because I am going to try and clarify uh, what investigation we have done with respect to this 303 number and clarify what that number comes from. But first, what I would like to do is introduce to the panel uh, and call as our witness, and uh, he can speak for himself, uh, Tony Miller, who you have heard about. He is the former Acting Secretary of State. He has many years in that office as Chief Deputy Secretary of State, uh, General Counsel, and Secretary of State's office. Uh, he has uh, addressed through his experience, two issues that are of particular relevance here that we've asked him to talk to the committee about. One is the question of whether it is feasible uh, to perform a match between the voter registration records and the INS records and what experience he has had from personal experience in his, in, in his office on that. And the second is this whole legal question. Uh, he is an attorney. As I said, he was general counsel in the Secretary's office. He is quite familiar with the law in this area. He has performed an analysis, which I think he's submitted to the committee in writing, uh, dealing with the issue of whether or not people who were not citizens at the time they registered to vote, but were in fact citizens at the time they voted, and were in fact on the voter rolls at the time they voted, should have their votes counted, or whether under California law those are votes which need to be disqualified either in election contest or in some other context. So at this point, I would like to introduce Mr. Miller and have him uh, address the committee. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I, help you God. I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank Mr. you. Chairman, you may proceed. Mr. Chairman and members, my name is Tony Miller. I have submitted a prepared written statement. Uh, I trust that the uh, committee members have it. Um, in the interest of time, I will go cut directly to the chase, and you don't have to hear me say all the wonderful things that I've done and how wonderful I am. You can read it for yourself in the prepared written statement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it has been asserted repeatedly today uh, that votes cast by United States citizens are invalid and cannot be counted if the citizen registered to vote 
prior to completing the citizenship process. That is, in my view, in all likelihood, an incorrect reading of California law. That's set forth in the legal opinion, uh, which I have prepared. Apparently, it's the only one that exists. The Secretary of State doesn't have a legal analysis. The District Attorney doesn't. I do, and now you do. In that opinion, it concludes that such a reading is contrary to the state constitution, is not consistent with the elections code, would violate the United States Constitution, and is contrary to case law and judicial practices in this area. First, and I'm just summarizing the points. Uh, you can read them uh, in, the, in the legal memo in detail. First, eligibility to vote in California is governed by... Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, not, don't, I don't, really don't mean to interrupt, but is this something that's before us that, he, that the gentleman's quoting? Oh, thank you. No, I apologize no. to the members. Well, I, okay. I assume that you We did. just, we don't no, have it. I thought very let, let you know that. Thank you. Now we're all on the same page. First, eligibility to vote in California is governed by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution of California, which provides that a United States citizen, 18 years of age, and a resident in this state may vote. Although the legislature is clearly authorized to add uh, a residency definition and a procedure for registration, the legislature may not diminish the right of United States citizens to vote at an election if they are otherwise qualified to vote. Secondly, the Elections Code itself, Section 2101, defines eligibility in terms of the requirements set forth in the state constitution that I've just mentioned and specifically speaks in future terms at the time of the next election. Now, that section should be read so as to harmonize with the Constitution of California, which requires citizenship only at the time of voting, not at the time of registration. And significantly, the challenge provisions in the Elections Code, if you want to challenge somebody at the polling place, that challenge with respect to non-citizenship is directed at the time of voting, not at the time of registration. You cannot challenge an individual saying, were you a citizen at the time that you registered, only are you a United States citizen at that point in time? And that's the Elections Code. Thirdly, in terms of the United States constitutional analysis, there is no basis, compelling or otherwise, in my view, to deny United States citizens the right to vote based upon their status at the time of registration. All individuals may be, may be required to register to vote, uh, clearly, that's a, a part of preventing fraud, but registration itself cannot be utilized as a barrier to prevent eligible citizens from voting in California. A blanket denial of the right to vote with respect to all citizens who do not complete the citizenship process prior to the election is, in my view, contrary to the Constitution. Fourth, even if it is determined that only citizens may lawfully register to vote, that does not mean that the votes of citizens who registered in good faith before completing the citizenship process should be summarily discarded. State courts have routinely uh, provided that one need not complete every detail with respect to the registration process to have a vote counted if the registrant is in fact eligible to vote based upon the constitutional requirements, which are limited to citizenship, age, and residency. Here, the purpose of the registration requirement is to help ensure that the constitutional eligibility requirements have been satisfied. Where an individual has, in fact, complied with those requirements, a deficiency in the registration does not make the individual's vote invalid. And there are repeated cases on that point cited in the briefs submitted to you. The bottom line with respect to this issue, new citizens should not be treated as second-class citizens. If they are registered to vote, and if they are United States citizens at the time they vote, their votes should be counted like every other United States citizen's vote. Switching to the other issue, the reliance on INS records to determine citizenship status. Admittedly, it's tempting to look to the INS to verify citizenship status of registered voters. It was a project that I explored extensively in 1994 when I was acting Secretary of State of California, the same year that I set up an investigative unit 
with respect to seeking out and preventing voter fraud, uh, an infrastructure in which the Secretary of State currently relies upon to his credit. In any case, when I looked at the INS project, I saw this as a way to determine uh, whether or not there was a problem with respect to non-citizens voting in California. And we engaged in numerous conversations with INS officials in Sacramento and San Francisco and in Washington about matching registration files against INS files. The project was abandoned, however, when it became obvious that the INS tapes were outdated, contained considerable erroneous information, and lacked a unique identifier that could be matched against voter registration records. We were advised that an attempt to match would yield unreliable results. On the one hand, it would miss those who had never had any contact with INS. On the other hand, it would produce a significant number of false positives. We were advised that tentative matches may or may, may not be the same individuals, and that in any case, the individual may or may not be a citizen. The attempted match would only be a starting point to a lengthy, labor-intensive investigative process that would require making actual contact with large numbers of registered voters. And we believe that such an investigation would inappropriately intimidate voters, unconstitutionally target naturalized citizens for special scrutiny, and chill voter participation. We abandoned the project to our credit. These experiences led me to believe at that time and continues to lead me to believe at this time that unless the INS records have been improved considerably, any reliance upon them to determine citizenship status is simply fraught with peril. And what you're going to have to do is put on your gumshoes if you get such a purported match and start knocking on doors because that's the only way you're going to find out whether or not these individuals are citizens or not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Picking up on one of the points that Mr. Miller referred to, and that is the reliability of the INS records. It was discussed earlier by counsel, and I will follow up on this right now, that we have, in fact, attempted to make some independent verification of the reliability of that information. Now, the committee ought to understand that up until now, the only source of information that's been provided to the District Attorney's Office and the Secretary of State's Office and has been released publicly with respect to the citizenship status of the various Ermondad, are they okay? Yes. Ermondad registrants, um, was based upon this fairly, as I understand it from Director Rogers' testimony, intensive checking of the INS databases, which included not just the electronic records, but uh, paper records, which were then first placed on handwritten notation of a list of Airman Dodd registrants that had been provided to the DA and then to the INS by the Registrar's Office. And then that was further apparently clarified, put onto a database, and submitted in response to uh, a subpoena request uh, that had been issued by Mr. Dornan to the DA's office. And in response to that, they provided the 1160 list with the INS notations, which included various categories which the INS had come back to the District Attorney and the Secretary of State for each of the individuals, and a notation if they were naturalized, on what date they were naturalized, and then whether there was a record or no record, and then there's a number which we are calling no notation at all, that is, it was a blank next to their name, which we have been told by the District Attorney, and I think independently can be confirmed from INS, are people for whom the INS has supposedly found a record of that person, but not in the citizenship unit. And that is a record that suggests that that person is a lawful resident alien, but not a citizen. We have taken those numbers, we have added them up, found out how many of them voted based upon the uh, registra registrar's records of voting. And our, rec and our categorizations conform generally to the numbers that the Secretary of State put out just recently. And that is that he had concluded that 303 uh, were, in his view, uh, non-citizens at the time they registered. Excuse me. Um, another 69 there were no records for, but who were foreign-born. 
and that's the group that's been suggested that perhaps those are either illegal aliens or maybe, uh, as Mr. Rogers suggested and, and we've suggested and our evidence has confirmed, they are in fact uh, people for whom the INS just couldn't find their records uh, or they are lawful uh, U.S. citizens because they are uh, children uh, foreign born of U.S. citizens. So we went out and if you look at the 303 number and you divide that up, right off the top there are 124 that we found and that I think that uh, it's clear from the records were people who may not have been citizens at the time they registered but were in fact citizens at the time they voted. And Mr. Miller has addressed uh, the, the legal implications of that. We firmly believe that these are United States citizens who voted. We don't quite understand what the justification is for denying a vote and disqualifying a vote, what public interest is served by disqualifying a vote whom everybody, from somebody whom everybody agrees was in fact a United States citizen at the time they voted and was in fact on the registration list. There are three people and so we believe that those were all legal. Of the remaining numbers, there were three who the INS showed uh, were in fact naturalized but within a week after the election, at least according to their records. There were 60 for whom the INS notated the list as showing that they were not naturalized and they were pending in the naturalization process uh, and concluded that they were not citizens. There were 14 uh, of the 18 people who were in the pending status review category who showed foreign birthplaces. And we assume that those are also included in the category, the INS has included them in the category of those who are not naturalized. We assume that those are also in uh, Secretary of State's numbers. There was one person who was listed as having been denied citizenship and there were 108 other people with the no notation next to their name who were foreign born, four others uh, who in fact showed United States uh, places of birth. So we went out uh, and tried to have some investigators in the short time we had uh, contact the people whom the INS records claim to not have been citizens. We visited a total of 68 out of what I believe is a, a 182, and I know I'm treading on thin ice here, uh, but I think it's 68 of the total of 182 people who the INS uh, said were not, uh, whom their records either found no records or they deduced that they were not uh, United States citizens, not counting the three who they said were subsequently naturalized, um, but after the election. And I think that's approximately 38% of the total number of the Airman Dodd registrants that were on the INS list that, that they reported back on. We found of those 55 of the 68, fully 80 percent, were in fact United States citizens at the time they voted. And these were people who showed us their naturalization certificates. We have some pictures, I believe. Some of those people were here earlier. I don't know if they're still here. Uh, we have some pictures of these people proudly showing their naturalization certificates. Many of them did not want to actually show us the certificate. They were afraid of, uh, of doing so, of, of, of releasing it. Um, but they confirmed the date of naturalization as well. I will tell you that of the 55, 32 of them had dates of naturalization prior to registration. And another 23 were naturalized prior to voting. From this, we have concluded that you just can't trust these INS records. Uh, if this error rate is so huge, and what we will do, uh, in that we have not had the opportunity to do this in the time uh, prior to the hearing, we will provide this by the close of the testimony with the names of these people so that they can be independently verified by anybody who wants. Um, and we will continue our efforts uh, to determine how many more people are out there that fall into those categories. Um, but we then extrapolated from the 38 uh, percent that we visited to the entire sample and that's how we have come up with the conclusion that there is a maximum of 70 uh, individuals who voted in this election who had been registered by Amran Dodd uh, uh, who were not citizens at the time they voted and whose votes could be de de determined to be illegal. At this point I will uh, let Mr. Aiken resume the presentation and respond to some of the issues that have arisen uh, in the other testimony. 
quickly on a couple of the witnesses that we've heard from. We'll be filing some documents with the committee, but I would just ask the committee to look at the timing involved uh, with the gentleman who testified regarding his conversation with Mr. Hernandez. Uh, at the time, apparently, the only thing we know about when the date was was that his wife had already completed and sent in her absentee ballot. That places her within a time frame close to the election when Mr. Hernandez clearly had been gone from the uh, Sanchez campaign for almost a two-month period. Uh, so again, it's another desperate attempt to somehow connect uh, Congresswoman Sanchez with what is appropriately uh, or looked upon as inappropriate conduct. I can also tell the committee that unfortunately Mr. Hernandez is not in the county at this time, but he was coming back from vacation, and we will file a declaration as we have talked to him personally, and he denies the statements, and we'll file that with the court. As the Mr. Sanchez carefully look at all of his declarations he's filed with the committee, and one will get an insight as to uh, what his agenda is, and I'll just let you look at those for yourself. Uh, I'm a little, I want to make one other reference, and again, unfortunately, and I know that there's been a certain cutting edge to my voice today, uh, but when I use or deal with the changing facts uh, on an hourly and, and minute by minute basis, uh, it is very frustration, uh, frustrating. So if I speak strongly and, and uh, with a very cutting edge, I may no disrespect to this committee, but I cannot tell you how offended I constantly get in dealing with this issue. For instance, Mr. Schroeder has just got up here a few minutes ago and said that Mrs. Uh, uh, Sanchez stood up here and said that they had subpoenaed various groups and, they, and he called that a lie. Uh, I have her written statement uh, that she read into the record, which she did not say she, that they had subpoenaed each of those groups. She said very clearly in her statement, lodged with the committee, that they had subpoenaed from the county the registration affidavit of all of those groups. So they're going through the registration affidavits of all of the affidavits checked out to the firefighters, uh, the teachers union, the Vietnamese community, and the Roman Catholic Church. So that's what she clearly said and suggests that she lied is an absolutely, frankly, outrageous uh, statement to say that in front of this committee. And of course, now we have the other remaining issue, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Sanchez is here to address that herself. But I would say if you look at the chart over there, we have. Uh, I know that Mr. Uh, Chairman Ellers has not been overly excited about some of the charts I've used here today, but we have a chart here, and, and it's amazing to me that we would use this issue because th that's the chart that was done when Mr. Dornan ran for office in 1984 where he registered under oath at three different addresses uh, within about a six-month period, two of which were, one was the Holiday Inn, and the other was a business at a strip mall, clearly not a place of his residence. And so it's a, absolutely shocking that they would bring that issue up as a basis to somehow continue uh, an investigation that we continue to urge the committee uh, is ill-advised ill and not appropriate. Uh, I certainly uh, have information uh, about uh, Mrs. Sanchez's residence, and she can talk to that issue directly. But let me tell you, when you look at those papers, you're going to see the kind of intrusion of privacy that has gone on involving the, a congressman, a congresswoman, excuse me, a representative from the 46th district. This is where they were going through trash cans. This is where they're going through mailboxes. And they have lists. They say on reliable information. Look at that carefully. They did not get most of this information from subpoenas. There was only one single document produced by a subpoena. So when they got into all of these uh, gas records and phone records, uh, this information never came by way of a subpoena, never came by way of a deposition. So obviously they got into her private records by some other devious way. And that is the problem that we've been dealing with from day one in dealing with this matter. And I'd like to reintroduce to you the Congresswoman from the 46th District who can tell you a little bit about domicile and about Woodbridge and where she lives and the circumstances of, again, a situation where this committee has watched Mr. Schroeder stand before you and literally accuse one of your colleagues of committing a crime and accusing her husband of committing a crime. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was out of the room when some allegations were made as to where I domicile. And I'd like to say that I do live in Garden Grove. I also was told that uh, Mr. Dornan made mention of the fact that uh, I had discussed my schools when I told you about the area that you've come to visit. And he mentioned that they were in North Anaheim and that they were out of the district. 
Well, let me begin by saying that North Anaheim is in the 46th Congressional District. Let me say that I went to Sunkist Elementary, where about a third of the students who go to that school come from the 46th District. I went to Sycamore Junior High, where about half of the students, and it is physically within the 46th District. And I went to Catella High School, which sits on the wrong side of the street to be in the district, but to where over half of the students who go to Catella come from the 46th district. More importantly, my church, and I am a Catholic, I go to St. Anthony's Claret Church, sits in the 46th district. It is where I have received all of my sacraments, even permission to marry outside of the state came from that church. And as Catholics, some of you will know, parochialism and where you sit and where you live is very important to the Catholic Church. Previous to living in Garden Grove, I lived in Anaheim. I live in Garden Grove. It sits in the district. As you know, I go and vote Tuesday through Thursday or Friday to Washington, D.C., and I come back to 12422 Woodbridge in Garden Grove. It is a condi condominium. My staff goes and picks me up in the morning if I have an early meeting, and they come to my house in Garden Grove. Mr. Dornan tried to use this issue against me in the campaign. If he wishes to use that issue, it is just that, in the campaign. It should not be used in this hearing here. And, that, and actually, the voters voted him down when he tried to use that issue because he tried to say that I live in a home, my husband's childhood home, that unfortunately my husband received through inheritance when his mother died of ovarian cancer two months after he and I were married. I do not appreciate, nor have I ever appreciated, Mr. Dornan using that home against me in election or otherwise. And I will tell you that I live in Garden Grove, and I'm very, very proud to represent the people of the 46th Congressional District. Thank you. We'll maintain order. Do you have further witnesses who wish to present other information? No, we will glad to answer questions. We have no further witnesses, no further presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, since you've just been there, would you mind returning and just for a few questions? I would like to ask a question about something uh, you, you tried to explain to us earlier about uh, in response to questions, I believe, from Mr. Hoyer about how you'd been at the door of someone. You explained to them how to vote for yes. you, but it wasn't an absentee ballot. It was... Uh, no, sir. It was an eight and a half by 11 folded over. All right. Uh, you mentioned several times that there was a reporter with you. That's correct. Uh, we, I just want to get on the record the name of the reporter in case uh, we ever want to refer to that. Dina Abriagetti from the Register. From the Orange County Register. That's correct, sir. All right. And thank you very much for that. Uh, the uh, issue about the the home, I, you know, this I had heard about this, but I didn't know any of the details, and I'm still a little confused by the California situation. Have you ever resided in, in the home at 1624 via Ariba? Yes, sir, for about 11 months. And when was that? That was uh, about 1992 or so. So have you ever registered to vote from that house? I believe so. Usually, I, as I move, I try to change my registration in, anticipati okay. in anticipation of an election. So you moved from there to Anaheim mm -hmm. That's and from correct. there to Garden Grove? That's correct. And that is the sequence, then. That's correct. All right. I appreciate that. I um, do not have any further questions for you. But Mr. Miller, would you take the stand, please? How long, how long were you in the Secretary of State's office? Were you a civil servant who moved up the ranks, or were you uh, a political uh, Appointee. Actually, I started in the Secretary of State's office in 1976 as Chief Legal Counsel, and I was not part of the civil service system. I was appointed by the then Secretary of State, March Fong Yu, uh, as a, an exempt employee, exempt from civil service. 
Uh, I remained as chief counsel uh, until actually 94, but I, in 1981, also became chief deputy secretary of state. All right, so, so you had almost 20 years of service there, not as a civil servant, but you had been appointed and worked yourself at the ranks. That's correct. And how did you become the acting Secretary of State? Is the, the Secretary of State, March Fong Yu, was uh, appointed to serve uh, the United States in the capacity of the ambassador to the Federated States of Micronesia. And under California law, uh, the Chief Deputy assumes the role as acting Secretary of State upon the departure oh, I, I of see. the so Secretary of State. There's not a new election or appointment of a new Secretary of State then? There can be, but there was none. And then if there's no uh, appointment, then the, the chief deputy continues to serve as acting secretary of state. And, and why did you leave now? I take it you're not there anymore. That is correct, thanks to uh, the current secretary of state, Bill Jones, who <laughs> defeated me in an election in 1994 by 35,000 votes, percentage-wise uh, closer than the one that is the subject of a contest. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> And did, I, you, did you file a contested election? I actually <laughs> saw the handwriting on the wall the next day and called Mr. Jones and congratulated him yeah, on his fine. election. So the classic case of someone who worked in the ranks and made the mistake of getting into politics. <laughs> uh, I, I have several questions for you. Um, you. You've stated very strongly that, you, that, that it was unconstitutional to say someone could not vote because they were not a citizen on the registration deadline. And, and I say that largely in the context of the California Constitution. I think there's a strong argument also with respect to the U.S. Constitution. But under the terms of Article 2, uh, Section 2 of the State Constitution, I feel very strongly about it having researched that issue now. Well, cl clarify for me then, as someone who's not from California. In, in Michigan, uh, the citizens are, are I'm sorry, the, the employees of the government are required to follow the laws. And if they suspect something is unconstitutional, they have to get an opinion from the Attorney General. But they have to follow the law until such time as either the Attorney General or the courts rule that the law is unconstitutional. Do you, that, in, in California, can you uh, oh, disobey a law simply because you believe it's uh, unconstitutional? No, in California, there's, there's a similar provision, it sounds, uh, as, as the one in Michigan unless it's a matter of the U.S. Constitution, and even state officials are bound by the U.S. Constitution. No, everyone's bound by the Constitution. The question is what, what uh, you do in, in terms of enforcing the law until such time as either a court or an attorney general renders an opinion that the law is unconstitutional. It is my view that with respect to uh, the United States Constitution that the elected official or the government official is bound by that and must adhere to the U.S. Constitution notwithstanding any other provision. One does not have to wait until one is directed by the Attorney General or by a state court or any other court. One must follow the U.S. Constitution. By that, you mean one's own interpretation of it? Well, or that some is legal? correct. Well, one does the best job one can in terms of following one's, uh, one's beliefs. How many cases of voter fraud did you prosecute while, or pursue while you were in office? Over the course of the 20 years, um, there were um, dozens of cases that were referred to local prosecutors. The Secretary of State does not have the authority to prosecute, refers uh, those cases. Um, actually, over the course of the 20 years, uh, there were several hundred referred uh, to district attorneys. The biggest uh, fraud we had in California, in my experience, was in San Francisco, when large numbers of persons were registered in San Francisco. Uh, at that time, one had to, in order to work for the city, had to be registered in the city. And we found a situation where a lot of employees of the city registered in San Francisco, in fact, lived outside the county. Uh, and there were a number of, of, of fraud cases coming out of that, uh, that circumstance. That's the biggest uh, situation of, of which I'm aware of, voter fraud in California. And when you were acting attorney general, did you refer any such cases of fraud? Acting secretary of state. I'm sorry, uh, acting secretary of uh, state. Cases were referred uh, to local prosecutors. Uh, as I indicated uh, earlier, uh, I created the voter fraud unit in the Secretary of State's office uh, in 1994 so that the Secretary of State would have the investigative uh, resources to follow up on allegations of fraud and actual fraud. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. No further questions. I realize my time has expired, but since I was generous with my colleagues and giving them a few uh, minutes, I just want to... Um, Oh, just, just one question, Mr. Mill. Well, it's actually not a question, just a comment. Uh, you reviewed extensively 
uh, databases and how the INS database is faulty. And I would just observe, uh, since, as I mentioned earlier, I've dealt with computers for many years and I'm familiar with databases, uh, simply because a database is faulty doesn't mean it's not useful. It can be a useful guide. It simply means that one has to be careful with the results that one obtains from the database and check them with another database or another reference before putting too much reliability in them. Would you, would you agree that's a fair statement? Uh, yes, I would. And uh, my only point with respect to that is the data that one gets out of those databases, whether they're related or flat or whatever, is a beginning step. And that beginning step may be an important step in a long journey to ultimately find some answers. But you're going to have to take many steps before you reach that result. And you're going to have to start knocking on doors and actually contacting people before you're going to know for sure whether the information you've received is accurate. And that's what's a bit scary about that entire process. That's correct. But I, I'm just trying to establish a point. You start with the databases. And so what, if the Secretary of State, Jones, or the attorney, uh, district attorney from here wants to pursue the case, uh, they will start with the INS databases. And then, but you were, you were simply giving a caution that having started there, they're going to have to do some legwork in addition to verify the accuracy of the results they get from the databases. That's am correct, I, Mr. Am Chairman. I interpreting you correctly? That is correct. My experience is you probably have a better chance of, of winning the lotto in California than getting the right answers from the INS. Well, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I could argue that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the lotto is right, like here, but uh, in Michigan, you are seven times more likely to be struck by lightning than win, to win the lottery. Uh, that doesn't prevent a lot of people from playing it. But I think that's totally inappropriate or inaccurate to compare uh, using INS database with the lottery. You certainly have better than one in seven million chance of getting the right answer. And the point is that I'm making simply is that's a starting point. From there, you begin, that, that may narrow down from the 1.2 million down to 10,000 or so that you have to investigate because they don't match the computer. And then you start doing the legwork to find out which one is right and which one isn't. All right, uh, the one very quick question for Ms. Lever. Uh, not, an, not an item of great attention, but simply in reviewing the various voter registration cards that have been presented to us in testimony today, there is at the top a box that says, are you a citizen, and check yes or no. Uh, I haven't seen any of them checked. What do you do with voter registration cards that come in that don't have that checked? voter registration card is signed. That, that checkoff box is relatively new on voter registrations. Uh, you can ask uh, Secretary of State as to when it actually got started because I can't remember. Um, but as long as that uh, penalty of perjury statement is signed, it's acceptable. All right. Interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hoyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller. Or Secretary Miller. Good day. I'd rather have you stand up there. I don't know what the cameras are doing, but uh, I want the answers. To... Well, you made a good judgment. Mr. <laughs> uh, Secretary, I want to make it clear what you're saying. First of all, you are not saying, are you, that it is all right to lie on the form? Absolutely not. I think the form itself is defective. It does not reflect uh, current law in California. But I am not suggesting at all that a person read that form, it says I am a U.S. citizen, whatever, and ignore uh, the facts. They must complete the form honestly. Secondly, as I understand it, you are not saying that if they voted as a citizen that we ought to forget about the fact that they misrepresented their citizenship status. No, that, that is clearly a case for the district attorney to follow up on to determine whether or not there was criminal intent. And Mr. Secretary, proceed. would you agree with Congressman, former Congressman Dornan that uh, those people may have believed, honestly, because they were going to be citizens in the near future, that it was all right to pursue that? And as uh, uh, Mr. Dornan has said, uh, he was not, nor should anybody be going after those people. Would you agree with uh, Mr. Dornan on that? He is absolutely correct on that one point. 
<laughs> I asked it precisely. Mr. Secretary, uh, you were Secretary of, uh, in the Secretary of State's office for a long period of time, some 20 plus years? Uh, 18, I believe it was. Contemporaneous with your 18 years of service, uh, Ms. Lever was uh, in the office uh, here in uh, Orange County. I mean, I take it on a, some sort of basis you had dealings with Ms. Lever, is that correct? I had that pleasure on many occasions. Now, I take it you had the opportunity to deal with election officials from throughout the state in your capacity as counsel and as acting Secretary of State, is that correct? Yes, sir. And can you characterize for me, as obviously expert in this area of how elections are run, Ms. Lieber's performance? She is very capable. She has good company. We are blessed with outstanding registrars and county clerks in California. She is actually one of the leaders uh, of that august uh, crowd, however. She's a very active participant with respect to moving uh, the elections processes forward in California, be it reforms or, or administrative uh, actions, she is an outstanding registrar. Now, you heard uh, the testimony that uh, Mrs. Lever has given today. As someone who's dealt with this election process for almost uh, two decades, uh, did the testimony that uh, you heard uh, reflect from your perspective an honest and accurate uh, representation of how an honest election is run, given the fact that, uh, as Ms. Sanchez said, mistakes are made. Uh, as Mr. Schroeder indicated, a tab here or a tab there, uh, we, we all make mistakes. Uh, would that be accurate? That would be very accurate. All right. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. I might say that's been my experience, uh, uh, as I said earlier. Uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Wucher. I won't even ask their opinion on where I should be. Terrific. <laughs> Short learning curve, right? <laughs> exactly. Ultimately, this is going to boil down to after we get all this rhetoric out of the way and all this anger and the unfortunate, I want to say, uh, uh, political attacks, which uh, I agree 100 percent with Ms. Sanchez, ought to be reserved to campaign. Uh, I know everybody's had trouble as to where they live, and frankly, I've been opposed by people who live outside my district, uh, and I was elected to Congress living five blocks outside of my district. Uh, that's political campaign stuff. This is a serious case. Uh, we have this 303 votes that allegedly should not have been counted. Uh, that's a significant number. That's a third of uh, what could make the difference, as was pointed out. I understand that and accept that. Uh, however, I want to say, Mr. Wucher, that I think that, uh, that we have not dealt very specifically on uh, all sides, with, which is somewhat troubling, and I've always taken the position that there's not yet credible evidence to show me the election was going to be uh, reversed. But let's deal with the 303, and I want to make sure I understand what you are saying. Of the 303, 124 of the 303, as I understand what you're saying, were citizens on November 5th. According to the INS's own records. Does that mean, when you say that, what does that mean? That means, I'm sorry, according to the printout that we have received, that the Secretary of State has received and the DA has received, of what the INS record shows. That is... That 124 names of the 303 names are shown by an INS to have been citizens on November 5th. Right. They say U.S. citizen and they have a date of naturalization that is prior to November 5th. Three were naturalized uh, within a week thereafter, so they clearly were not citizens. Correct. Sixty were pending na uh, naturalization, so they were not citizens. Fourteen uh, foreign births. Now, of the fourteen foreign births of U.S. citizens? No. There's a category called PSR, Pending Status Review. Right. 
that's notated on that list. Would it be fair Mayor, to conclude that those 14 then were not citizens on November 5th? That is the conclusion that was reached by the district attorney and we believe by the Secretary of State in their affidavits. Uh, and four were U.S. born, so clearly they are U.S. citizens, assuming that uh, that's correct. They and we were believe not felons and lost their. They were still U.S. citizens, but lost their. Correct. And we believe that in the Secretary of State's numbers, he is the Secretary of State has never broken these down specifically into these categories. But as we've added the numbers up, we believe that the Secretary of State would would conclude that the four U.S. born are in fact U.S. citizens as well, and did not include them in his 303 number. Now, in reviewing this, uh, 303, did you, that, by the way, as far as I computed, adds up to 206, the 124, the 60, the 14, the 1, which was the denied, uh, the 3, and the 4. Right. Of the remaining uh, 97, uh, we know, we have no information on that? Well, there is no notation next to their name on the list that came back from INS. We have subsequently been told that the fact that there is no notation simply means that there was no, no, no record found in the citizenship unit of those people having applied for citizenship, but they are in fact in the INS database, presumably in the database because they have at some point come in contact with the INS. The conclusion is it's because they are legal resident aliens people with green cards or something like that. We were confused ourselves by the fact that there were some who were affirmatively designated NR for no record and another hundred or so that were designated with nothing after their name. And so we checked and we were told that that meant that they were pres presumptively not citizens, that the INS had a record on them. And we concluded that if they were foreign born, the assumption was that somebody was assuming they were legal resident aliens. Now, the last question, uh, of the 124 who were citizens at the time of voting, does your investigation reflect uh, whether or not any of those, in fact, contrary to the belief of the Secretary of State, Mr. Jones, or Mr. Capizzi, were, in fact, citizens uh, prior to uh, the either the 25th, the swearing in on October 25th, uh, or prior to uh, the 29 days before the election, which was whatever, October 10th, 12th, 15th? We have not visited any of those 124. We were prepared to, to accept the INS record that said that if the INS at least believed that they were naturalized citizens as of the date of the election and had a date there, we were not going to spend the limited resources we had in the short time we've had this list available to go and confirm whether or not the date that the INS had for that person was correct. These are well, people my that point, the INS... My point, Mr. Witcher, yeah. is apparently the record from INS is that as of... Uh, the 29th day before, or the date of their, let's strike the 29th day, the date of their registration, they were not citizens. Correct. And many of these people... So that the presumption is at the point in time between the signing of the registration form and the voting, they became citizens, correct? Correct. Those 124. Now, my question to you is, and I think the, you don't know the answer to this well, question, as to whether or not, in fact, we've heard testimony from uh, Secretary Miller and others, INS perhaps made a mistake and that, in fact, some of those folks were citizens prior to their registration as opposed to subsequent to their registration. That's correct. We do not have any information on that. We took the INS data on that particular point and, as Mr. Miller would say, on that one point uh, to be correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for uh, the time. And, uh, thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has more than expired. Mr. Ney. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wucher, sorry. Might as well keep you up there for a minute. I didn't think it would be quite that easy. <laughs> uh, the question I had is, uh, will you provide the committee with the names of the specific individuals you contact in regard to the 303? We, we certainly will. We would like to work out, uh, before we do so, some sort of privacy agreement so that we don't uh, have those names being bandied about uh, further. We've been very careful in the, when we've contacted these people to assure them that we would make uh, only good use of that, and so we'd be glad to do that. Certainly, but presumably we can work it out before I'm the, the sure close of the hearing. Sure, and Mr. Oyer, Darren, we <coughs> communicated on that type of issue in the past week here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, Mrs. Sanchez, Congresswoman Sanchez. Okay. Thank you for your time. Uh, has uh, anyone on your official congressional staff told anyone else uh, not to respond to subpoenas? 
Say this once again. Has uh, anyone on your official congressional staff told anyone not to respond to subpoenas? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And, um, and just in conclusion, I just want to confirm what I believe you stated earlier. Uh, but I don't know if I completely asked it in the proper way. But did you or your campaign have, and campaign meaning the staff and the mm -hmm. managers or people in position of authority? Well, you're only asking of about three people. I didn't have a big campaign okay. staff. <laughs> it was one of those underdog campaigns, if you know what I mean. I've been there. <laughs> I have a 16% Republican district. <laughs> so, I mean, Democrat or oh, Republican. I, I got confused on that. Uh, you have a 16% uh, Republican district? It gets confusing. District. So well, I've, I've I had an incumbent of 18 Everybody's years. Everybody's doing it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Those little mistakes, you know? That's right. Uh, anyway, um, did uh, you or your campaign have any communication contact with or coordination with Hermana Dot or Nat, uh, Nativo Lopez or his campaign? With Nativo, I did have one meeting. Realized that after I came out of the primary, um, a primary that I will tell you was uh, a very divisive primary, one which um, I got into very late and therefore did not have a lot of support from opinion leaders. I really went to the people to win that primary. After the primary, I went back to every group that I knew of, as anybody would, churches, you know, Girl Scout groups, Boy Scout, Little League mothers, PTA, everybody you can to see where you can pick up support. And I did meet with Mr. Lopez um, with respect to getting help from Hermandad. Uh, unfortunately, he stated that he would not support me um, because he had a long standing relationship with Mr. Dornan. Thank you. Thank you. I just might add that Mr. Jost is here, and if you'd like to hear his uh, testimony under oath, that he did not ever advise anybody not to respond to subpoena. He's available, Congressman A, if you'd like his testimony under oath, that he did not do what he was accused of. No, I, I never, I just said staff. Okay. No, I'm fine. Hey, I see. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I think respectfully that uh, if, if that's the case, I think you ought to him, I'd, I'd suggest give him an opportunity simply to dime what, what I will. Uh, if if Mr. Aitken wishes to call him for order. My name, he was. Mr. Chairman, yeah. as uh, I never made this clear, I'm the only one on the committee didn't. As a uh, teacher by degree, I'll take the, the advice of my counsel today. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Mr. Aitken, you Just, wish to call him. If he'd only keep doing I, uh, it, would since, be so. Since well. he was named, <laughs> I mean, since he was personally named and happens to be here, uh, I thought it might be appropriate. Will, so uh, Mr. Jost would come up. I guess I can. Well, uh, quick. Quick addition to the agenda. We'll, we'll allow that in this case without objection. Mr. Yost, will you raise your right hand? <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force in the matters that are con under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Representative May, you have a question? Uh, well, I actually, just to make it clear, Mr. Gears, I just ask, has anyone on the staff, but since I guess your name was used earlier, I'll ask you, uh, have you, uh, or do you have knowledge of anyone on the official congressional staff told anyone not to respond to subpoenas? No. I think what Mr. Schroeder was referring to was a quote in a newspaper article, and as I recall the quote, and I, he could perhaps read it into the record, I w was quoted as saying, we will follow on every subpoena. And for the, for the record, um, I've not had any contact with any individual that's been subpoenaed to my knowledge. And any inquiry that we get, all staff are directed to refer to Mr. Aiken or to Mr. Wucher. And that included anybody who uh, contacted this office with respect to appearing or any matter with regard to subpoenas. Do you think we should not believe newspapers? Don't answer that. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony, your excuse. Uh, Mr. Ney will not be interviewed by the media after this, <laughs> after this hearing. We uh, now move in the final phase of the agenda, and that is to take public comment. We have uh, four representatives. Standing. 
We have four representative organizations who have uh, indicated a desire to offer public comment on behalf of their organizations and others. We will uh, take them in the following order. First, Mark, five minutes per person and no questions from the panel. The uh, first one is Mr. Mark Rosen, attorney for Amron Dodd. And uh, he will be followed by Barbara Coe from the California Coalition for Immigration Reform. Zeke Herman Hernandez will be next, president of Santa Ana League of United Latin American Citizens. And that uh, will be followed by Glenn Spencer, the voice of Citizens Together. And you are Mr. Mark Rosen. Rosen. Yes. Would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of this honorable committee. My name is Mark Rosen, and I am the attorney for Hermandad Mexicana Nacional, which has been uh, mentioned for the last nine hours, and uh, this is our two minutes to briefly reply. And I'm not going to uh, attempt to address everything that has been stated to the committee today. This is not the proper forum for that. Uh, there are still investigations taking place, although I want to stress there have been no indictments, no charges. All we know is that there is an investigation taking place. Herman Dodd Mexicana Nacional has been in, in existence for over 50 years. It has na uh, offices nationwide here in Santa Ana, as well as Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and other cities. It is uh, one of the largest Hispanic organizations na nationwide in providing services to its constituents and to its members. And those services include health care, legal assistance, tax preparation, assistance in obtaining government assistance, and the conducting of citizenship classes. Uh, Herman Dodd also offers its members access to insurance and other goods and services. And in, in addition, to all of those activities, Herman Dodd has operated and continues to operate a voter registration program in the Hispanic community in the cities in which it operates. And although this service has received a great deal of attention, it is still a very small part of the overall activities of Herman Dodd. Herman Dodd's philosophy is that all of these activities, including obtaining citizenship, uh, obtaining uh, services for its members are all part of participating in the mainstream community and allowing Hispanics to participate in that community both as tax-paying members of those communities and to empower the Hispanic community so that it is able to protect itself, defend itself, and participate in the American citizenship process. Uh, it strives to make sure that its members become good citizens, better citizens, and better Americans. Now, I'd like to address just briefly some of the uh, statements or accusations that have been made based on what is uh, already a public record. In January of this year, uh, the district attorney of the county of Orange uh, obtained a search warrant to seize records from Herman Dodd. And that search warrant was based on the statements, anonymous statements of five people who were described as confidential informants and who were not identified in that search warrant. Allegedly, these five people stated that they had registered to vote before becoming citizens. Uh, I don't know if the committee has a copy of the affidavit, the Contreras affidavit, uh, which was the basis for that warrant. But if you read that warrant, you will find that of the five people who were cited, three of them were interviewed by the district attorney's office they had contacted the Registrar Voters Office and, and asked about whether they were eligible to vote. They then called Herman Dodd, called the Herman Dodd Office and Santa Ana, and they were told by employees of Herman Dodd that they could not vote if they were not citizens. Herman Dodd people told them that. And that is in the public record. It is quoted in the affidavit. Of the other two, one of those persons refused to talk to the district attorney at all. So we don't know the connection between that person and what, if anything, that person was told by Herman Dodd. And the fifth person had actually taken, uh, registered and taken citizenship classes from Herman Dodd in 1994 and had not had any contact with Herman Dodd, I believe, for a two-year period. It's on the basis of that that the search warrant was issued. It, this 
and, and I just want to emphasize there are two sides to this story. You have heard a lot of uh, statements from the district attorney. You have heard a lot of statements from Dornan's people, but there are two sides to it, and at the appropriate time, our side will be brought out in much greater detail. Now, you've heard Mr. Dornan's counsel say, say today that in addition to everything else they've subpoenaed, they want some 11,000 case files of people who have uh, gone through Herman Dodd services. This is for an election contest. They want to look at 11,000 case files to see what 11,000 people have had uh, by way of services, which may be totally unrelated to citizenship, totally unrelated to voting, but they want to snoop through that anyway. And that ought to illustrate to this panel that from Dornan's perspective, these subpoenas and this process is nothing more than a witch hunt, that it's not designed to get at uh, the truth of this matter is designed to harass the Hispanic community. I see my light is flashing here. Yes, your uh, time has expired. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments and testimony. And I, I hope uh, everyone else who's appearing recognizes the lighting system. Maybe you weren't here when I explained it. When the yellow goes on, you have one minute. When the red starts flashing, you're finished. Uh, next, we have Barbara Coe, California Coalition for Immigration Reform. Would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I help do. you God. Thank you. You may proceed. Well, first I want to say that I'm the chairperson of an organization uh, who represents people of every race, creed, color, and political preference throughout our nation. I'm very grateful, gentlemen, for the opportunity to speak here today on voter fraud a problem that, to our knowledge, has been continually escalating since 1991, to our knowledge, when an entire city, the city of Bell Gardens, was literally taken over by non-citizen and illegal alien votes. And at that time, a fully, fully documented data package containing several hundred names, photos, addresses, the whole uh, documented information was provided to our Los Angeles District Attorney, as well as our then Secretary of State, Mr. Miller, both of whom re refused to take any action whatsoever to halt this activity and force our laws or protect our vote. Now, in the interim, of course, we have been advised constantly and have been compiling cases of voter fraud throughout our state, and this whole scenario is very frightening because the sacred right of the citizen-only vote is the very foundation of our democratic system and the rights and the freedoms for which many of our loved ones of all nationalities have fought and died to preserve. But those rights and those freedoms are now being threatened by those who hold our vote and the laws that govern our vote in contempt, knowing full well that there will be little or no consequence for the violation of those laws. And this, of course, includes unethical citizens who vote mul multiple times, register their pets, the bounty hunters, who registered the deceits, but, but most importantly, it includes the non-citizens and undocumented immigrants who knowingly vote, all of whom are in violation of both state and federal law, and which to date, those laws have not been effectively enforced. Now, we are saddened that many within the Latino community have chosen to identify themselves as the victims of those of us who stand in defense of our laws. But please know, this is their choice, not ours. But on that note, since they have chosen to make it an immigrant issue rather than a legal issue, we do have several questions because we believe this is a nation of law. And we would ask, why Herman Dad, Mexicana Nationale, was given 35 million of our tax dollars to conduct citizenship classes along with other things, then why did so many of those people state that they were still so confused about citizenship that they went ahead and voted anyway? We simply do not accept that. We also wonder why a similarly structured organization known as Southwest Voters Registration who states that they registered hundreds of thousands of, quote, new citizens, omitted the, the requirements to be a U.S. citizen on their primary literature. But most of all, we wonder why Ms. Sanchez 
and many of the pro-immigrant groups, and we do know that there are many, regardless of some of the things you've heard today, uh, is this is an individual who took an oath of office to uphold our constitutional rights and enforce our laws. We would think in that capacity she would welcome a full investigation of all of these voter fraud allegations. We also wonder why she and some of the pro-immigrant groups have not provided the data quickly and willingly so that this situation could be resolved once and for all. We also wonder why, if there's nothing to hide, there are so many objections. Because not only does this committee, but also every loyal American citizen deserve to know the truth. And we are confident that you people will not rest until you have gotten to the truth. In the interim, however, the coalition lauds and applauds the efforts of Mr. Michael Schroeder, our DA Michael Capizzi, our Secretary of State Bill Jones, who has illustrated his courage and determination to halt voter fraud in our state because he does know it exists. And last but surely not least, on behalf of all gravely concerned American citizens, we want to extend a debt of gratitude to Bob Dornan for literally forcing national attention on this most serious problem, and also to you gentlemen for your efforts to resolve it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate that. Mr. Zeke Hernandez, President of Santa Ana League of United Latin American Citizens. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force in the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Mr. Chairman, members of the Congress, my name is Zeke Hernandez, President of Santa Ana LULAC, League of United Latin American Citizens. We were founded in the United States in 1929, here in Santa Ana, California, in 1946. Um, I, re I recall that as you made your introductions to the public here in Orange County, you uh, and your comments were pro-immigrant. So I, I recognize that, and you are also pro-American when you are pro-immigrant. I am going to read some um, uh, parts of several letters that we have sent to various entities of government. One, which started on May 7th, 1992. This was addressed to uh, President Bush at that time. Um, LULAC at that time wanted to do something with the citizenship process in terms of reform. Um, and we re and in reading this letter to him, as you are quite aware, there's a growing public debate on whether or not immigration is an asset or burden to the U.S. economy. Studies upon <coughs> studies, including studies commissioned by your administration, have shown that immigration has had a positive impact on the U.S. economy and not a drain. This debate has fueled immigrant bashing and racial hatred and division during the time, gentlemen, during the time when this country needs to be working together versus against each other. This is a letter we sent to President Bush asking that he take a look at our proposal for a fast track citizenship. We received a response on October 7th from the Department of Justice INS and in their letter they said to us, a portion of that letter says, a person may become a citizen of the United States only in the matter and under the conditions of designated in statutes enacted by Congress. Under its constitutional power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization, any change in statutory requirements must be made by an act of Congress. I encourage you, gentlemen, to go back to Congress and enact some reforms, and enact reforms where we can make citizens, immigrants, citizens at a quicker pace. Continuing. We had a new president. We addressed a letter to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, we met with him when he was a candidate, and on this letter, dated March 6, 1994, uh, it was at a meeting that we had with him in Los Angeles. And in this letter, a quote, we have provided your administration with a proposal for fast-track citizenship, which outlines a need for reform, which to this day has not been seriously addressed. And I would guess you would uh, uh, agree with that in terms of the INS has not been addressed. This proposal was prepared by LULAC and submitted to you by the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. I have copies here which I will provide to you of our uh, fast-track citizenship. The fast-track citizenship is we as citizens of, Amer of, of the United States uh, submitted to, the, to, um, to Congress, submitted to the President. This was, this was pulled out of, of, uh, out of the files 
by a Congressman William Zeleff, who is chair of the Government Reform and Oversight Committee's Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice. We felt it was a slap to our community when a subcommittee on internal affairs and criminal justice would pull records to show that our request that immigrants become citizens of America would be detrimental to the United States. We have, on October 30th, in 1996, prior to the election, we have shown to you and to the public that we were very, very much concerned about irregularities in terms of intimidation at the election polls here in Orange County. We quoted the Orange County Register, which carried a story indicating their representatives of FAIR, specifically Barbara Coe, again planned to attempt to interfere with the voting rights of Orange County residents by prominently posting signs targeting persons of color in heavily minority areas and specifying that only citizens can take part in the, in the voting procedures. We are all aware of this, ladies and gentlemen. That's the reason why we sent the letter to the Department of Justice asking that they come into Orange County so that they can safeguard the, the, the citizens of, 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 the United, of the United States. We saw this in this that we also received a letter from the Department of Justice dated December 11th. This is a response to the letter that we, we sent to the Department of Justice in October. December 11th, after the elections, in, in the Department of Justice, coming from De, uh, uh, Devil Patrick, who was the Assistant Attorney General, he said to us, we can assure you that this matter will continue to receive our continued attention. Members of the hearing committee, we are a group known as League of United Latin American Citizens. We are proud of our heritage. In fact, members of our ethnic community, our Latino community, number very prominently in terms of giving their life for the United States of America as Medal of Honor recipients. We are proud of all of those individuals and we have provided to you, to the Department of Justice, the President of the United States, both a Republican and a Democrat, an opportunity to make immigrants a citizens at a much faster pace than they have been doing in the past. We have supported Irmandad and we, can, we will continue to do that, but most importantly, Ermandad and Leith and Lulac favor a, the integrity, the integrity of the voting system, and we will not, we will not uh, diminish that, that stance there. Thank you very much. Your time has expired. Thank you very much for Mr. your Mr. Chairman, I do have copies of this. Would you, and, and I understand that uh, we were just notified today, but uh, uh, copies are here for you. We, are, uh, we will continue to provide you with additional copies. We, have, um, uh, we are preparing that, and we'll prepare it to you for your committee, as well as responding to the request by the minority uh, member of the committee that uh, for a hearing to take place regarding additional testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Final witness, uh, Mr. Glenn Spencer, Voice of Citizens Together. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this task force and the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm president of Voice of Citizens Together. We're a grassroots organization based in Sherman Oaks, California. We're also multi-ethnic, and I look back with fondness and pride in the six years that I spent working with American Indians in the Northern Plains and also with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and I have a good record on that basis. Uh, I'd like to talk today about the issue of the uh, crime of voter fraud. You're looking into this issue. It seems to me that if there's a crime, oftentimes you look for two things, one motive and two opportunity. We've seen today that in California there are many fold opportunities for this crime if it does happen. But I would like to talk about motive just for a moment. I would like to go back to the Atlantic Monthly Magazine of November 1996, where Stanford professor David Kennedy said the following, quote, the United States has had no experience with what is taking place in the American Southwest. In the next generation or so, we will see a kind of Chicano Quebec taking place. Professor Kennedy characterized it as saying that it was a reconquista, the taking back of the American Southwest that was taken from Mexico as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. In 1986, the American Congress passed, the President signed the Immigration Reform and Control Act which granted amnesty to millions of illegal aliens, many from Mexico. 
That was an attempt to stop illegal immigration. As we see from recent census data, it didn't work. In 1994, five million Californians passed Proposition 187, but it was blocked by U.S. District Judge Mariana Felser, who said that it was an illegal state scheme to control immigration. A scheme. We believe it was legal. We believe it was not a scheme, but I will agree. It was an attempt to stop the invasion of California. This month, the United States Attorney General Janet Reno, testifying before Congress, said that the surge in application for citizenship was mainly due to Proposition 187. As a result, she was saying then, if we believe Judge Felser, that the surge in citizenship was caused by an attempt by Americans to control immigration. Following the passage of Prop 187, we saw an enormous backlash. In January of 1995, meeting at the University of California at Riverside, Latino leaders, some 400 strong, met to determine how they were going to deal with this issue. At that meeting, and we have it on videotape, Art Torres, who is now the chairman of the California Democratic Party, said as follows, quote, Proposition 187 was the last gasp of white America in California. The meeting then went on to determine that what had to, be happen, had to happen was the Latinos had to get the, the power of the vote to stop Proposition 187s from ever happening again. Since that time, we've seen a flurry of activity, not only with the Southwest Voter Registration and Education Project, Hermandad Nacional, Mexicana Nacional, and others. But let's look at Hermandad. I'm going to tell you, we have looked at Hermandad. Yes, it was founded by a Marxist-Leninist, as described in the Los Angeles Times. Yes, their documentation shows that their initial concept was to represent undocumented immigrants, illegal aliens. Their flag, their logo is the Mexican flag. In my judgment, we're looking at Mexican nationalism. At the same time, this surge was ongoing in these groups. We saw Citizenship USA, a born within this current administration. Led by Vice President Gore, this Citizenship USA is now coming under mounted criticism for cheapening the citizenship process and for fraud by the INS itself. Then at the same time, these things were going on. The Mexican government stepped in and offered dual nationality as an inducement for Mexican nationals who were not naturalizing at the normal rate to become U.S. citizens. That according to Jorge Bustamante writing in Mexico's Excelsior newspaper, this was to create lobbyists for Mexico in the United States. And this effort was initiated by the Council General of Mexico in Los Angeles. And recently, in response to our legislation, a new legislation on immigration, the President of Mexico said, quote, we will not tolerate foreign forces dictating and enacting laws on Mexicans. This is our law. It was also quoted in the Los Angeles Times that their debate over that law was likened to do a declaration of war. So I want to say in summary, we looked at motives. We saw a motive on Reconquista. We saw a motive to become President of the United States, and we saw a motive by the Mexican government to increase its influence in our Southwest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spencer, and thank, uh, thank you to all of you. Just a few comments in closing. As I said at the outset, we are, our purpose here is to obtain facts, obtain data. And this is the beginning of a process of hearing from the attorneys and from the contestant and contestee and from the public what actually happened in this election and this, the sorts of things we can only find out by conducting a field hearing, a hearing on the merits of the case. I have mentioned also uh, how we will proceed from this point. We will continue to see, receive written testimony. We have displayed an address here where you can uh, send your testimony if you wish. Uh, testimony relating to this hearing until April 30th. I do want to comment also, Mr. Hernandez just mentioned a moment ago, he thanked us for being pro-immigrant. But I also 
uh, wanted to comment Ms. Coe's testimony on her, her ardent desire to ensure the integrity of the voting process. And I want to make a point here, which I think has been lost in all the words that are flowing back and forth. Those two goals are not exclusive. I hope we can have both. We should be pro-immigrant. We should be, in, we are a nation of immigrants. We should not be anti-immigrant, and this panel certainly isn't, and I don't believe the Congress is. We are also in favor of honest counting of elections, honesty in all aspects of elections, whether registration or in voting. And that is our goal, to have a nation in which everyone who has the right to vote can vote without intimidation and fear, and everyone who votes can be confident that their vote has the appropriate weight because everyone else is voting legally and not illegally. And that is the goal of the Congress. I believe that should be the goal of the entire nation. And we will do our small part in trying to ensure that by investigating as carefully, as thoughtfully, and fairly as we can the election that took place here in the 46th District. We've heard a great deal of testimony. A great deal of it is at variance with other testimony. It is up to us to sort through the facts, determine those as best we can, and make the best judgment that we can as a panel about what happened in the election in the 46th District, who the rightful winner is, and make our recommendation to the Committee on House Oversight and to the Congress of the United States, which has the final power to make a determination. Everyone here has been most helpful in that process, and I truly appreciate those who participated, and I've appreciated also those who have observed throughout the day and, and within this chamber and in the antechamber, and also those who held demonstrations outside. I talked to some of them during the noon hour and thanked them for parti their participation. Uh, after all, I'm a Berkeley graduate. I'm familiar with demonstrations. <laughs> uh, it's a very important part of the freedoms that we have in America to demonstrate and display our opinions and our feelings, so long as we do it peacefully. And I just genuinely appreciate the spirit that has been present in this hearing today of helping us in our effort, uh, not simply throwing slings and arrows at each other, but honestly trying to uncover the facts and prevent, present them to us as convincingly as possible. And that's been very, very helpful to us. And the entire spirit of the hearing, the, sp the spirit of the participants, especially the spirit of the audience and their questions to me when I met with them various times during the day. I deeply appreciate that. Finally, my, my heartfelt appreciation to the, the city of uh, Santa Ana and the county of Orange. Their staffs have been incredibly helpful to us. The security arrangements have been superb and the, uh, the physical facilities have been outstanding. So I thank everyone present, thank the city, the county, and we will adjourn the session and go back to Washington and get back into the nitty-gritty of it. Thank you very, very much.